Welcome back to this video series on Revelation of the Book of Revelation, where by God's grace and the help of the Holy Spirit, verse by verse, we are going to crack open the meaning of the Book of Revelation. Not based on any man's opinion, but using Scripture to interpret Scripture. And through this video series, we're going to bring the meaning of the Bible to life so that we can see its relevance to significant recent and soon coming world events and all that is currently unfolding on the world stage today. As I mentioned in the introduction, in this video series, I am going to lay a foundation by starting with explaining the timeline of the book of Revelation, which is a topic that will consist of several episodes because it's too much to cover in one video. And in the process of explaining the timeline of the book of Revelation, I will give you an overall summary of the story of the book of Revelation and the main key events that take place in the book of Revelation. And most importantly, an overview of the timeline with the main key events that take place in it will also bring to light what Abba Father's beautiful and magnificent plan is in all that will take place for those who walk closely with him in an intimate love relationship with him. Because above all the terribly destructive events and great deceptions of the enemy, that Abba Father warns us about that will take place in the book of Revelation, Abba Father is in control the whole time. And when we understand what his plan and purpose is, in the midst of all the horrific destructive events that are about to take place, as all that was prophesied in the book of Revelation begins to unfold, we can be ready and prepared for it and able to walk through the coming storms with a sense of great excitement, encouragement, and hope, and be strengthened and equipped to face the tough times ahead with a fearless faith. So starting the video series on Revelation of the Book of Revelation, with the topic of the timeline of the Book of Revelation, has a lot of benefits in that way. And then in later episodes of this video series on the book of Revelation, when I explain each key event in more detail, I can keep coming back to the timeline so that you can be orientated to see where it fits in, in the bigger picture and how everything falls into place. Secondly, in the process of opening up the timeline of the book of Revelation from scripture and key historical events, I hope to show you how extremely close we are to all the events prophesied in the book of Revelation actually literally taking place. Much, much sooner than I think many people realize. And in the introduction to this video series, I hinted that we are approximately somewhere in or around the beginning of the season of the final seven years, in which all the events prophesied in the book of Revelations will unfold, emphasizing the point that we better start paying attention to all that Abba Father said in the book of Revelation because we are just about to go through all that is mentioned there. And in fact, what has been prophesied there is already beginning to unfold before our very eyes at a rapid and accelerating pace. And from this video now, and in the future episodes to come, we are going to begin to present some very solid evidence to pinpoint exactly where we are on the biblical time clock so that we can be given insight, wisdom and understanding 
that will equip us to recognize where we are in biblical prophecy and discern the signs of the times we are presently in, as Yeshua cautioned us we must do in Matthew 16, verse 1 to 3, where he rebuked the Pharisees for not having any discernment about the signs of the times that they were in. Because biblical prophecy concerning all that Yeshua would do in his first coming was being fulfilled right in front of them, and they were totally ignorant to recognize it. And now, my friends, we are in the time in biblical prophecy where all that is going to happen around Yeshua's second coming is about to be fulfilled right in front of our very eyes. And so we need to be diligent to study the scriptures like Daniel and the sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12 verse 32, who also had an understanding of where they were in the timeline of biblical prophecy and therefore had wisdom and discernment about what was the best course and plan of action for Israel and themselves to take in their lives at that time. And in the same way, this knowledge, wisdom and understanding will equip you to make the right decisions in your finances, business, which is really his calling and destiny on your life, and in every area of your life. When you are able to, to discern the signs of the times in which we are now living in 2023. And it's going to equip you in all the ways that you need to be, to be ready for the time ahead. Mentally, emotionally, in many physical, practical ways, and especially in terms of understanding how to be spiritually prepared. To soon meet our Saviour, Redeemer, Bridegroom and King, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua the Messiah. And in this video, which is episode one of the timeline of the book of Revelations, we are going to begin by unveiling the mystery and meaning of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. That not only sets the foundation of the book of Revelation timeline, which reveals the first key historical pinpoints that reorientates us to where we are in time in the biblical time clock, but in the process, breathtaking and mind-blowing, undeniable evidence is going to be unveiled that provides solid proof that Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, is who the Bible says that he is, the Messiah and the Son of God. Now, as you probably saw when you clicked on the video, this is a very long session. The first reason is because this whole video is one complete story from beginning to end. And so I can't split the video into shorter sections because then pieces of the puzzle would be lost and people would miss the big picture and not gain the full revelation and understanding of the profound information that is going to be shared here. If they don't watch each section of the story in order from beginning right through to the end. And the second reason this video is so long is because I have to be very thorough in the scriptural and historical evidence that I present, given the critical importance and huge weight that the content of this message holds. And at times you're going to have to be patient with me and give me time to lay a solid foundation from scripture and key historical events on a certain concept. But I encourage you to keep watching because that foundation will suddenly open up the most incredible treasures as the meaning of the mysteries of, of his word that has been hidden for so long suddenly become crystal clear to you. 
and the most unexpected golden nuggets of revelation open up along the way. It is honestly, absolutely wow. And what you are going to see is critically important and extremely relevant for you and I today in this time that we are living in, in 2023. And I encourage you not to be intimidated or put off by the length of the video. Just eat the elephant one bite at a time. Just watching 15 or 20 minutes a day will add up. And before you know it, you would have gotten through the whole video. And your life opened up to life transforming revelation in the process. And by watching a little of the video every day, a wonderful benefit that comes with that is that it's going to keep you in the Word of God daily in parts of Scripture that are very relevant for all of us to know and understand today. And as I previously mentioned in the introduction, even though these videos are long, the beauty of it being online is that you can stop and start whenever you want to. And in the description below each video, in this video, as well as all the episodes to come, I have added time markers where titles of the different sections start to help you find your place when you start watching again from where you may have left off before. So please make use of the list of titles in the description below each video. It will be very helpful for you as you work through this teaching series. And I have three last housekeeping points to mention before we can dive into the main subject of this video. Firstly, this message is a follow on from session 10, part one, where I shared in detail about how our father revealed his end time plan to us through the seven biblical feasts. I have emphasized several times now that this video is very, very important because the whole storyline of the book of Revelation is based on the prophetic meaning of the biblical feasts. And so without a background understanding of the seven biblical feasts, it is impossible to understand large portions of the book of Revelation. And we saw some examples of the reality of that in the first introduction video that was released prior to this one. So I strongly encourage you to work through this vitally essential teaching on the seven biblical feasts and have it fresh in your mind whilst you go through the rest of this video series on the book of Revelation, including this video where I am going to refer back to the biblical feasts a lot to bring to light the meaning of different portions of scripture as it relates to the end times. And then there are four other background videos that precede this one that you are watching now. Session 10, part three, where I shared about what it practically means to be ready as the bride of Christ for Yeshua's return. Session 10, part four, where we studied the four horses of revelation to discover their relevance to what is unfolding in world events today including the recent health crisis the whole world just went through, which was a significant, extremely important event that marked world history turning the page into the final chapter where we entered into the beginning of the time of the book of Revelation, where all that is prophesied there is now starting to unfold right in front of us. And then there is another video that preceded this one called the introduction to the timeline of the book of Revelation. And the main objective of that video was to give you a glimpse of what is to come in this series and to share with you some important points that need to be established at the start. And then finally, there is another video that precedes this one called the introduction part two which is about the critical importance of the proper name of God and the Son of God during the time of the book of Revelation. 
where I explained in depth why it is really absolutely critically important and vitally necessary for me to start calling the God of the Bible, which is Yahweh, and the Son of God, our Savior and Messiah, by their proper names, as we embark on the series of the book of Revelation. Because as you will see in detail later on, his name, Yahweh, becomes extremely important and a very big deal in the end times. Because that will be one of the main things that Satan or Lucifer and the Antichrist goes after. He wants to erase the name and image of Yahweh from all of creation, including the human body. Which, as we will discover in detail in a later video, is already happening through the medical technology in the pharmaceutical products that were rolled out in 2020 on the pretext of the recent global health crisis. And we will see in the book of Revelation, for example, Revelation 14, verse 9 to 11, that Lucifer wants to replace Yahweh's image with his image, which is the image of the beast. And Lucifer wants to replace Yahweh's name with his name, which is part of the mark of the beast prophesied about in the book of Revelation. And for the end time bride of Christ, his real proper name of Yahweh and the real proper name of the Son of God becomes an extremely important weapon of spiritual warfare and protection. And it always has been. For example, in Mark 16, verse 17 to 18, it says, In my name you will drive out demons, heal the sick, etc. But in the end times, we are going to need his name more than ever before. For example, Proverbs 18, verse 10, in the original Hebrew text that scripture was written in, says, The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. And as we get into this in great depth and detail later, we will really come to appreciate in a much deeper way the reality of the scripture. We even see this in Psalm 91, which is God's promise of protection, which interestingly, we will see in a later episode, lists all the disasters and catastrophic destructive events of the end times that take place in the book of Revelation, such as the seven seals and seven trumpets, etc. And even here it says that a key weapon of spiritual warfare and supernatural protection for his people is his name. Psalm 91 verse 15 says, Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will save him. I will set him securely on high because he knows and understands my name. And his real name is Yahweh, which in Hebrew is spelt from right to left in this way. Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, which in English is Y-H, VH, which is pronounced as Yahweh. For example, in the introduction part two, we studied Isaiah 42 verse 8. And when we went to the scripture in the original Hebrew text, we saw that it says, I am Yahweh, that is my name. Yahweh means the great I am. Yahweh is the great I am. In the introduction, part two, we studied lots of scriptures there. Another one was Isaiah 45, verse 5, where in the original Hebrew text that scripture was written in, it says, I am Yahweh, and besides me there is no God. And the Hebrew word for God there is Elohim, which means the Almighty Creator. And so, from now on in this vid video, and all the videos to come, 
I am going to refer to the God of the Bible, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as Yahweh. But at times I will also refer to the God of the Bible, Yahweh, in closer, more endearing terms as Abba Father, because he is not only the almighty God of the entire universe, but we are also privileged to have a close, intimate love relationship with him, where as Romans 8 verse 15 to 16 says, as his child, we can call him Abba, which means daddy in Hebrew. He is our Abba Father. Now, many Christians know the Son of God, who is the Messiah, as Jesus, because that is the name we see everywhere in the New Testament, because it is one of the ways his name was translated in Greek. And I'm not saying that this is completely wrong, because there have been many people who have been healed, set free and delivered from demonic spirits, etc., in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. But remember that Jesus was born into a Hebrew culture and he taught Hebrew speaking people. And his name is actually a Hebrew name, which is Yeshua. Or another way to say it exactly as it is spelt in the original Hebrew is Yehoshua. As you can see in the Strong's Concordance on the screen, which means salvation, which was the instruction Yahweh gave Mary through the angel Gabriel to call her son in Matthew 1 verse 21, because he was the son of God who came to die on the cross to provide our salvation as our savior and our Messiah. And amazingly, our Messiah, the Son of God, was mentioned throughout the Bible, starting right in Genesis 1 verse 1. And then throughout the Old Testament, right through to the book of Revelation. And in the original Hebrew text of Scripture, his name is Yeshua. And on the screen, you can see the different ways his name is spelt in Hebrew. And as I said, it means salvation. So even though his name has been translated as Jesus in Greek, his real name is Yeshua. Yeshua is what his mother, brothers and disciples and everybody else called him when he was here on earth in his first coming. And that is what we will call him in heaven in eternity. And I go into a lot of depth about that in the introduction part two. So most of the time, in all the videos of this Book of Revelation series, I'm going to refer to our Savior, Messiah, Bridegroom and King as Yeshua. But whether you personally call him Yeshua or Jesus, we are talking about the same person, okay? The Son of God who died for us on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, the Messiah. And be rest assured, I am not talking about another God or another religion or another cultic off the rails version of Christianity. In the introduction part one to this book of Revelation series, I expressed how serious I am and how I am depending on Abba Father and the help of the Holy Spirit with everything I've got to share his pure, uncompromised word with nothing added and nothing less. And much of the things that I'm going to share in this book of Revelation series, I have studied and researched for 20 years. But I have spent the last two years of my life with lots of fasting and praying and testing and testing everything I'm going to say in this series against scripture to make sure for sure everything I share is his pure truth as much as is humanly possible. So believe me, I don't take this whole subject lightly. And that is a big reason why the teachings in this video series are so long because I thoroughly establish everything that I say in scripture. So these five videos are essential background foundational knowledge that precedes this video. And all of these videos are freely available on various platforms such as YouTube, Rumble, Vimeo, etc. And the links to these videos can be found in the description below this video 
and also on our website, which is shown on the screen. And by the way, the website is a really good place to use as a homepage for working through all of these videos. As you can see from the snapshot of our website shown on the screen, because the videos are nicely arranged there to help you watch them all in order and keep you on track of where you are with all the different videos in this series. In order to get the maximum benefit from this video series on Revelation of the Book of Revelation, I would strongly recommend listening to these sessions first before listening to this video as well as any of the coming episodes, as each session builds on the essential background foundational knowledge of the previous sessions. So please heed my advice to watch these five background videos in order, which is best for you. Otherwise, in this video and the coming videos, you will feel lost at times and not understand what is going on. And if you haven't already, be encouraged to go to our website, www.goldeneagles.africa, where you can join the Eagles Wings Network, which then means that you will personally be sent the links to any new free videos that are sent out in the series of, on Revelation of the Book of Revelation by telegram or by email, depending on your personal preference. Although from our personal experience, I strongly recommend joining both because technology fails us at times. So if you don't get it on one platform, at least you can get it on the other one. So when you go to our website on the home page, you will see a button that says join our network. And when you press on that, it takes you to boxes that look something like this which is the place where you can enter in all the necessary information that we need to be able to send you the links to any new videos that are released in this Book of Revelation series. And to help you, in the description below this video, we have also included the link that takes you straight to this page on our website, where you can enter in your information to join if you haven't already. And there you will also find the link where you can join the Eagles Wings Telegram channel to receive the new video links and any information related to the Book of Revelation series as well. And please do partner with us in helping us to spread this vitally important message by letting others you know about the opportunity to join this network so that they can also be blessed with this revelation, knowledge and understanding about the book of Revelation. I also strongly encourage you again to download these videos because there will soon come a time when it won't be possible to make this information available on the internet. On our website, we have a function which enables you to download the videos onto your own computer or phone or whatever. Also take note of the different platforms that these videos are on. For example, for each video, we have a link for Vimeo, Rumble, etc. Because if a video is taken off one platform, at least you will know where to find it on another. Links to the different platforms where each of these videos are on is on our website and also in the description below this video. Where I can, I will include some of the teachings on YouTube, but unfortunately, because of the increasing censorship of information by the world's elite to stop the truth from getting out there, many of the teachings I will not be able to upload on YouTube. So again, that's where it also helps to join the Eagles Wings database from where we can send you the links to each of the video messages so that you don't miss out on any videos, especially the important ones with some very important life-saving information. Okay, hallelujah. Finally, now we can get into the meat of the message and start our study on the main topic of episode one, 
which is unveiling the mystery and meaning of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. As I mentioned in the first introduction video, somewhere along the way through the course of history, the exact year that we are in was lost. In the Roman Gregorian calendar that the world uses, it is now the year 2023, which in the biblical calendar used by Hebrew scholars says that from the time of creation, it is the year 5784. But it is also well known amongst Hebrew scholars that this is out by 200 and something years, which is a lot. So that creates a very vague, non-specific, highly inaccurate idea of where we are in history. But even though mankind lost track of where we are in the calendar through the centuries, the Bible gave us key events to look out for that pinpoints where we are in the biblical calendar. In this particular episode of the timeline of the book of Revelation, we are beginning with the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, which gives us the first key historical events that reorientates us as to where we are in the biblical calendar. And then in this video, as well as in later episodes to follow, I will add to that other pieces of the puzzle from other prophecies that contain key prophetic codes to the timeline of the book of Revelation by Hosea, Jonah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, and a multitude of other scriptures with key prophetic parallels and patterns that opens up even more the bigger picture to the point where it actually reorientates us with a much more accurate and closer idea as to where we are on the biblical time clock within an estimated present accuracy of give or take one or two years. And in the introduction to this video series, I hinted that we are approximately somewhere in or around the season of the final seven years. And so having said that, what we really want to get to is learning about what exactly the Bible says is going to happen in these last critically important seven years of world history that we are all just about to go through. But you're going to have to be patient with me because to firmly and solidly establish our timeline from Scripture on the book of Revelation and the final seven years, we first have to go way back in history to the few years just after 605 BC in Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel was given two key prophecies, one related to 70 years and then another vitally important one that is extremely relevant to us today is called the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, which prophesied about some key historical events leading up to Yeshua's first coming, the time of his ministry and when he was crucified. And in this episode, you are going to see how all the key historical events in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel unfolded and took place exactly right on time with phenomenal mind-blowing accuracy in the exact years as scripture foretold it would. And those events are the first pinpoints that help reorientate us to where we are in the timeline of the biblical clock, which then will lead us to understanding where we are in the final seven years of the book of Revelation timeline. So in this episode one, we are going to go on a journey together of studying and really unpacking scripture to reveal the mystery and meaning of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel that forms the foundation of the prophetic timeline. And it's only possible to understand the timeline of the book of Revelation and all the significant end time events that take place during the final seven years of world history, including accurately understanding what the Antichrist is going to do concerning the abomination that causes desolation until we first understand 
the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. To give context to this, this was at the time when the people of Israel were in captivity in Babylon. As a part of the judgment that came upon Israel for rebelling against God, the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple, and God's people were taken into captivity in Babylon, which was under the rule of the king of Babylon called Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel lived during this time, and during this Book of Revelation series, we will see how this time period was a prophetic foreshadow that parallels the end times when the world will once again be under the control and grip of Babylon, and just like in Daniel's time, where the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, was the leader of the world at that time, as well as demanding to be worshipped as God, likewise, in the end times, there will also be a one-world ruler, who is the Antichrist, who also demands to be worshipped as God. And we will see how the lifestyle of Daniel and his friends during that time is written in the Bible for the purpose of showing us how to walk through the fire and difficult circumstances of the end times that we are all just about to go through. During this time of captivity in Babylon, Daniel was given several prophecies about how the future would unfold. Later in this video series on the book of Revelation, we will study Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel interpreted the meaning of the statue in the dream of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which described the different beast kingdoms of Satan that would unfold through history. First, the empire of Babylon, in which Nebuchadnezzar was king. Then the empire of Medo-Persia, headed by King Cyrus. Then the empire of Greece, headed by Alexander the Great. Then the Roman Empire. Then the British Empire. And eventually, the end-time beast kingdom of the Antichrist, which is a combination of all of these previous beast kingdoms. And we will see how that tied in with the vision Daniel was given in Daniel chapter 7, which also described these same beast kingdoms. And both of those visions ended with a description of the final seventh eternal kingdom of the Messiah who would come. And Daniel wanted to know when this would all take place. And the angel Gabriel came to Daniel with an answer in the form of this very significant prophetic timeline called the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. As we go unpack each piece and part of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, what is going to open up and be revealed to us is the years on the biblical time clock of when the Messiah would begin his ministry what year he would die on the cross to provide salvation for mankind, and when the gospel of salvation would then spread from not only being preached in Israel, but to all Gentile nations throughout the world. And later, we will thoroughly understand the reason why this is so important. Because as I've mentioned several times, when you know the timing of all the events surrounding Yeshua's first coming, other puzzle pieces in other prophetic scriptures are going to open up to us the timing and season around his second coming. The countdown on the timeline towards all these events that took place in the Messiah's first coming in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel begins with a key pinpoint on the timeline when the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was sent out. And then the second key pinpoint on the timeline is when Jerusalem is actually rebuilt. But before we get there, let's just go back in history to lay a foundation of what happened in the storyline 
in the build up to this point because there is some very interesting and pretty incredible things that happened and it's going to help you appreciate the significance of each detail of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel when we get there. In the time of the first temple period, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied that the city of Jerusalem and the first temple would be destroyed because of Israel's rebellion, disobedience and idolatry and their refusal to listen to the multiple warnings through Yahweh's prophets and repent. And Jeremiah prophesied that they would go into bondage and captivity in Babylon for 70 years. We read this in Jeremiah 25 verse 1 to 11. The word that came to Jeremiah in regard to all the people of Judah in the fourth year of the reign of the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, For these twenty-three years, from the thirteenth year of Josiah the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, the word of Yahweh has come to me, and I have spoken to you over and over again, but you have not listened. Although Yahweh has persistently sent to you all his servants the prophets, you have not listened, nor even inclined your ear to hear his message, saying, Turn now, everyone, from your evil ways and the evil of your actions, that you may not forfeit the right to live in the land that Yahweh has given to you and your forefathers forever and ever. And do not go after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands, and I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, says Yahweh, so that you have provoked me to anger with the work and idols of your hands to your own harm. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, hear this. I will send for all the families of the north, says Yahweh, and I will send for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, to enact my plan. And I will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride the sound of the millstones grinding meal and the light of the lamp to light the night. This whole land will be a waste and a horror and all these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So here we see in this prophecy of Jeremiah that because of their refusal to listen to the prophets warning them over and over again to repent of their idolatry and disobedience, Eventually, they would face Yahweh's judgment, where they would go into the bondage and captivity of Babylon for 70 years. Let's have a look at the significance of why it was specifically a 70-year period that Yahweh sentenced the people to go into bondage and captivity, which takes us to the principle of a jubilee, which is worth explaining because the jubilee principle is actually one of the major prophetic codes that opens up a lot of revelation to the book of Revelation timeline. And you will see it come up over and over again as we unpack the timeline of the book of Revelation in this series. You see, everything in the Bible, and especially in the book of Revelation, works in the patterns of seven. It started at creation in Genesis, where Yahweh worked creating the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he had a Sabbath rest. This is also a foreshadow of the bigger picture of the timeline of world history 
where Yahweh has given a total of 6,000 years for mankind, and then the final 1,000 years is what Scripture calls the final millennium Sabbath rest, which begins when Yeshua comes with heaven's armies, which is his worshipping warrior bride riding with him, to defeat the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. And Yeshua sets up his throne in Jerusalem, from where he will rule and reign on earth with his bride for 1,000 years in the final seventh millennium Sabbath, which will be a time of peace and rest throughout the earth. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says, A day is like a thousand years to Yahweh, and a thousand years is like a day. So just as there are seven days in the creation week, so there is a total of 7,000 years in the overall biblical timeline. And then, as it pertains to Abba Father's great agricultural wisdom, he gave another pattern of seven for his people to follow, where he instructed the people to work the farmlands in cycles of seven years. We are in the same pattern of seven he set at creation. For six years, the people could work the land and plant crops. And on the seventh year, they weren't to plant anything because it was a Sabbath rest for both the land as well as the people. Can you imagine what a blessing it would be to have a whole year of rest? Just to spend time in fellowship and relationship building with your family and friends and fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters in Christ and spending lots of extra time with Abba Father in his presence and in his word in intimate fellowship with him. This lifestyle pattern from Abba Father set his people up to prosper spiritually, emotionally, psychologically and physically as the health of their spirit, soul, and body flourished because of this wonderful lifestyle pattern and principle Yahweh put in place. We see this in Leviticus 25, verse 1 to 7. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I am giving you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to Yahweh. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath rest for the land, a Sabbath to Yahweh. You shall not sow seed in your field, nor prune your vineyard. Whatever recedes itself uncultivated in your harvest you shall not reap, nor shall you gather the grapes from your uncultivated vine. It shall be a year of sabbatical rest for the land. And all of you shall have for food whatever the untilled land produces during its Sabbath year, yourself and your male and female slaves, your hired servant and the foreigners who reside among you. Even your domestic animals and the wild animals that are in your land shall have all its crops to eat. It did take faith for them to obey his instruction and rest for the whole of that seventh Sabbath year, because they had to trust Abba Father to provide for them while they weren't working the land in that year, which he did do, because he gave them a double portion bumper harvest in the sixth year to last them through the seventh Sabbath year of rest, which was the same pattern you see when Yahweh supernaturally provided for the Israelites in the impossible conditions of the desert. On the sixth day, which was a Friday, he would provide a double portion of manna so that they didn't have to collect manna on the seventh Sabbath day and could just rest. We see this in Exodus 16, verse 22 to 23. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, this is what Yahweh commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for Yahweh. 
So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. And in the same way, according to the same pattern, just like Yahweh provided an extra double portion for the people on the sixth day before the Sabbath rest on the seventh day, he also provided extra in the sixth year before the Sabbath rest on the seventh year so that both the people and the land could rest in the seventh year. And apart from causing the people to blossom, flourish, and be more fruitful in their spirit, soul, and body, in their personal lives as a result of this rest, there is a lot of agricultural wisdom in giving the land an opportunity to rest every seventh year, because it gave the land a chance to replenish its minerals and everything needed for the harvest of crops in the years to follow after that to continue to be abundantly fruitful and yield bumper harvests in the next six years following that. And imagine if we practiced this principle and pattern of Yahweh all over the world through all these past decades and centuries. This faithful stewardship of the farmland would result in such an overflowing abundance of food that there would be no poverty or hunger in the world. When you abide by Yahweh's principles of his word, including his principles of the Sabbath rest in all these different ways that we are learning here, you always experience his extravagant, overwhelming, abundant blessing in every area of life, in your spirit, soul, body, health, finances, relationships, everything is blessed. But when you don't abide by his kingdom principles of his word, which means you come out from the covering of his protection that the boundaries of the instructions of his word provide, then you fall under the curse, which means you are in the open with no boundaries of protection, and the enemy is able to come in and steal, kill, and destroy in every area of your life, bringing sickness in the form of stress-related diseases, from the lack of rest Yahweh created and designed your body to have, in the cycles of life he established in creation, he robs you in your relationships with God, yourself and others because you're too busy. Your finances suffer as you no longer experience his provision in abundance. And the enemy just steals, kills and destroys in every possible way that he can. And if you have a look at the economic cycles of the world in history, you will see that every seven years there is a global economic recession or drop in financial prosperity and the land does not produce in the abundance that it has the potential to in Abba's creation because the world doesn't live by the wonderful blessings of Yahweh's kingdom principles and patterns. They are in the slavery and bondage of Egypt and Babylon. But when you live according to the instructions of Yahweh's word, it's like returning to the promised land where you live in the Garden of Eden. And interestingly, the Hebrew word for Garden of Eden is gun. And oh my goodness, did we lose so much of the richness of the meaning of this word in the English translation of our Bibles. The full meaning of the Hebrew word Garden of Eden is an enclosure for a bride, fenced in with pleasure and delight, which is the part that Eden refers to, hedged within the boundaries of the instructions of God's word. Wow, how about that? So one of the instructions of Yahweh's word for our blessing in every area of life is that with the land, he set a pattern of seven for them to follow where they worked the farmland, planting crops for six years. And then in the seventh year, both the people and the land had a Sabbath rest. Then Yahweh explained that they must continue the seven year pattern for seven cycles. 
In other words, seven times seven years, or seven multiplied by seven, which equals a total of 49 years. And then the 50th year was an extra special year, which was also a Sabbath rest called a Jubilee. This is all explained in Leviticus 25, verse 8 to 12. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. Then you shall sound the ram's horn everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim freedom for the slaves throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee year of remission for you. And each of you shall return to his own ancestral property that was sold to another because of poverty. And each of you shall return to his family from whom he was separated by bondage. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow seed, nor reap what reseeds itself, nor gather the grapes of the uncultivated vines, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its crops out of the field. So what was special and wonderful about a jubilee year is firstly all debts were cancelled and slaves were set free. So for example, if somebody had lost their land and inheritance because of poverty and debt, that land would be returned to them on a jubilee year as all their debts were cancelled and they were set free. There's a lot of spiritual significance to a jubilee year, as we will uncover in future episodes to come that is just so absolutely wow. It's too much to explain properly here, but just to briefly mention two golden nuggets of many more to come on this jubilee principle. Yahweh set the lifespan of man to be 120 years in Genesis 6 verse 3. And in the same way, he gave a lifespan of 120 jubilees to mankind, because 120 multiplied by 50 years, which is a jubilee, equals a total of 6,000 years. As we unpack the meaning of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, we will see that Yeshua was crucified on the, on the cross in exactly the year 4000, which was a jubilee year. It was the 80th jubilee because 80 multiplied by 50 years or jubilees equals a total of 4000. And what was the significance of Yeshua being crucified on a jubilee year? Well, remember, the Jubilee principle, as we read in Leviticus 25, verse 8 to 12, was where people were set free of their debts. Their debts were cancelled, and the slaves, the captives, were set free, and their inheritance that they had lost was restored to them. That was a foreshadow of what Yeshua would do for us on the cross, where his blood shed for us set us free from slavery to sin, and we were given the opportunity to be forgiven of our debts, in other words, be forgiven of our sin, by applying his blood to our lives through repentance. And through the salvation he gave us, he restored our inheritance to us in Christ, as Matthew 6 verse 12 and Ephesians 1 verse 11 explains. My friends, let me tell you, absolutely every little minuscule detail in the Old Testament is about him. Absolutely everything, really, literally everything, the entire Bible from beginning to end is about Yeshua and what he would do for us in his first and second coming. It's all about this divine romance between the King of Kings and his bride, a love so beautiful that they both laid down their lives for each other. He was crucified on the cross to pay the bride price 
and give us redemption through salvation. And the bride lays down her life for him by crucifying the flesh and dying to self. So that as Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in and through me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Yeshua was crucified on a jubilee year to set us free from our debts and from slavery to sin and to restore our inheritance in Christ to us. Then in later episodes, we will see that the events surrounding his second coming is also on a jubilee year, which is the 120th jubilee at the end of 6,000 years given to mankind. And the fact that his first coming was on the 80th jubilee and his second coming on the 120th jubilee has loads of significance, which I'll mention later in this video. But for now, let's come back to the Jubilee principle as it relates to the beginning of the story here, which is setting the foundation for the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel timeline. Remember, the prophecy of Jeremiah said, that because of the Israelites' refusal to listen to the prophets warning them over and over again to repent of their disobedience and rebellion against Yahweh, eventually they would face Yahweh's judgment, where the first temple and the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed, and they would go into bondage and captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And we want to answer the question, why was it specifically 70 years? The reason was because the people were not obeying Abba Father's instructions in Scripture, including the Jubilee principle and his instruction to rest the land every seven years. The 70 years was the exact number of years of Sabbaths in 490 years in the period from Saul to the Babylonian captivity. In other words, the Israelites were in disobedience for 70 cycles of 49 years, and they had not honored 70 jubilees as Yahweh had instructed. So they were judged with a 70 year punishment in exile and captivity in Babylon whereby one year in captivity was sentenced for each of the 70 jubilees they had not honored Yahweh in concerning his jubilee principle of rest and restoration. And how do we know this? Well, it was very clearly and explicitly explained by Yahweh in Leviticus 26 verse 34 to 35, which we will look at in more detail later but you can also go and read it now for yourself if you'd like to. And so to restore the 70 years of rest that the land of Israel was due and needed, whilst the people were taken away into captivity in Babylon, so it wasn't possible for them to continue to farm the land, the land was left desolate and given a much needed chance to rest and recover Although, as we will see as we go along in the story, there is a lot more spiritual significance and importance to this than just resting the land. But nevertheless, this story is a chilling example that when Yahweh gives instructions in his word, boy, does he mean it. And so, because of their disobedience to the instructions in Yahweh's word, the people went into bondage and captivity for 70 years, where the 70 years was the exact number of years of Jubilee Sabbaths in 490 years in the period from Saul to the Babylonian captivity that the Israelites did not obey and honor Yahweh in concerning his Jubilee principle of rest and restoration. 
and that number, 490 years, is significant. So make a mental note in your mind to remember it. Because we are going to see the same number of years show up in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel timeline. Because this first story about the 70 years and the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel that were both mentioned in Daniel chapter 9 are connected. And both are ultimately connected to the book of Revelation timeline and how it is so extremely relevant to you and I. So stick with me because the story that is going to unfold before us is amazing, eye opening and breathtakingly wow. History unfolded exactly as Jeremiah had prophesied, whereas part of the judgment that came upon Israel for their idolatry and rebelling against Yahweh, the Babylonians under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the city and the first temple. They took many of the temple treasures and put them in the occultic temples of Babylon, together with all the idols of the demonic gods in the ancient Babylonian religion, which is the Baal worship of Lucifer. And Yahweh's people were taken into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. This 70 year time period began with the first deportation of Hebrews to Babylon, which included Daniel and also his friends Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego with the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC. This was mentioned again in Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 1 to 14. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders in exile and to the priests, the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. The letter was hand carried by Elasa, whom Zedekiah king of Judah sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon saying, so says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the captives whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not in decrease in number. Seek peace and well-being for the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to Yahweh on its behalf for its peace and well-being. You will have peace. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your false prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. Pay no attention and attach no significance to the dreams which they dream or to yours. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says Yahweh. For thus says Yahweh, when 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will visit and inspect you. Which means Yahweh will inspect their hearts to see if the walls of pride around their hearts had finally fallen. And if their hard hearts had finally softened in brokenness and deep, genuine, sincere, heartfelt repentance. Carrying on with reading the scripture. When 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will visit and inspect you and keep my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans and thoughts I have for you, says Yahweh. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. This scripture in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, where Yahweh says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future, is a well-known scripture that is often quoted in Christian circles. But now you can see the context where this well-known verse comes from. And notice that hope and future comes after genuine, sincere, deep, heartfelt repentance. 
and returning in that repentance back to Abba Father's kingdom ways, and most importantly, returning back to him. Carrying on reading the scripture. Then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear your voice, and I will listen to you. This verse always reminds me of what my grandfather used to say to me in the days before cell phones, where we only had landlines. In reference to Jeremiah 29 verse 12, he would say, Do you know God's phone number? It's 2912. Call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear your voice, and I will listen to you. Then, with a deep longing, you will seek me and require me as a vital necessity, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says Yahweh, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will free you and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says Yahweh. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. You see, whenever we walk outside the protection of the boundaries of the instructions of Yahweh's word, and we don't heed our Father's multiple voices of warning to repent, it eventually opens the door for the enemy to come and steal, kill and destroy, and for curses to come that takes us into bondage and captivity to the enemy. But in the midst of those consequences that eventually come as a result of our sins, Abba Father's mercy is still there, where even those judgments are a call to turn back to him in repentance so that he can restore the blessings that he always wanted for us. Just like we see in this passage of scripture that we just read, where we saw Abba Father reassures the people that after the 70 years of captivity to Babylon are over, and he sees that the walls of pride around their hearts have finally fallen, and if their hard hearts have finally softened in brokenness and deep, genuine, sincere, heartfelt repentance, he will fulfill his promise to restore them to their land, the land of Israel, and their beloved city of Jerusalem which is exactly what happened. Which brings us to another very interesting and fascinating part of the story. In 539 BC, as accurately foretold in Daniel's prophecy, in Daniel chapter two and chapter seven, the empire of Babylon fell and was taken over by what then became the global empire of Medo-Persia, which was now headed by a new world leader called King Cyrus. Soon after King Cyrus conquered Babylon in October 539 BC, to his astonishment, he encountered a letter that was written to him one and a half centuries earlier by the prophet Isaiah which specifically addressed him by name, where 150 years in advance, Yahweh foretold the birth of Cyrus and what this king would do, and accurately described his spectacular career in which Yahweh would help him to conquer all the nations. Like King Nebuchadnezzar, King Cyrus was a shadow and type of the Antichrist, where he was both a one world leader and also considered as a god. King Cyrus and the empire of Medo-Persia was involved in the same occultic religion of Babylon that just took on a new form to adapt to the Medo-Persian culture of the time. So the same beast kingdom of Satan from ancient Babylon now just took on a different cloak, but remained essentially the same thing in that it was still foundationally the same demonic religion of the Baal worship of Lucifer. But even though King Cyrus was an unbeliever, 
Isaiah prophesied of how Yahweh would stir up the spirit and heart of King Cyrus and use him to accomplish his purpose, which was to set the people of Israel in captivity free so that they could return to Jerusalem and Judea and rebuild the city and the temple. King Cyrus's astonishment at this amazing letter that had been specifically written and addressed to him, calling him by his name and his title as King of Persia, 150 years earlier before he was even born, resulted in him releasing the Hebrew captives to return to Israel to rebuild Jerusalem and their temple, and even to fund the whole project. This amazing and astonishing letter to King Cyrus by the prophet Isaiah is found in Isaiah chapter 45, which not only foretells of King Cyrus freeing the Hebrew captives, but also mentions the other key pinpoints on the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel timeline which is the coming Messiah who would provide salvation for mankind and how the gospel of salvation would also spread to the Gentiles. Let's have a look at some of the key verses regarding all of this in Isaiah chapter 45, which also mentions the key events we will later see unfold in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. This is what Yahweh says to his anointed, to Cyrus, king of Persia, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him. And I will ungird the loins of kings, disarming them, to open doors before him so that gates will not shut. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, the hoarded treasures, and the hidden riches of secret places, so that you may know that it is I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who calls you, Cyrus the Great, by your name. Wow. Remember, that was written 150 years in advance to it really happening. Isn't that amazing? For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and of Israel, my chosen, I have also called you by your name. I have given you an honorable name, though you have not known me. I am Yahweh, and there is no one else. There is no God except me. I will embrace and arm you, though you have not known me, that people may know from the rising to the setting of the sun the whole world over, that there is no one else except me. I am Yahweh and there is no other. Rain down, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds pour down righteousness, all the blessings of God. Let the earth open up. Let salvation, Yeshua, bear fruit and righteousness spring up with it. I, Yahweh, have created it. Here in verse 8, it foretells of a saviour, Yeshua, that's Yeshua in the Old Testament, who would come and provide salvation, because remember, the name Yeshua means salvation. If you go and have a look at the original Hebrew word for salvation in the scripture, it is a variation of the Hebrew spelling of Yeshua, as you can see from the Strong's Concordance. And remember, in the biblical feasts, Passover prophetically represents when Yeshua would die on the cross for our sins. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, when he would be buried in the tomb for three days and three nights. And then the Feast of First Fruits, where he would raise from the dead to become the first fruits of many to come, which is you and I and all who would become born again and receive salvation through accepting what he did for us on the cross, as was explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 23. And so that is why there is mention in verse 8 of the bearing of fruit 
in the context of Yeshua providing salvation, because he was the first fruits of many to come, which is you and I and all the other believers to follow him. Continuing reading Isaiah chapter 45 from verse 13. I have stirred up Cyrus and put him into action in righteousness to accomplish my purpose, and I will make all his ways smooth. He will build my city and let my exiles go without any payment or reward, says Yahweh of hosts. For this is what Yahweh says, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush, which is ancient Ethiopia, and the Sabaeans, men of stature, will come over to you and they will be yours. They will walk behind you in chains of subjection to you. They will come over and they will bow down before you. They will make supplication to you, humbly and earnestly saying, most certainly God is with you. And the Hebrew name for Yahweh in original scripture here is El, meaning strength. And there is no other, no other God, Elohim, besides him. So in verse 14 here, it describes how the nations that Cyrus conquers acknowledge that it is Yahweh that is helping him do this. And also in verse 14, there is also a prophecy which will also be mentioned in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel of how the gospel will be spread to the Gentile nations where many will also come to believe in Yahweh, the God of Israel, who is the one and only true God. Continuing with reading Isaiah 45. Truly, you are God who hides himself, O God of Israel, Savior. They will be put to shame and also humiliated, all of them. They who make idols, who go away together in humiliation. Israel has been saved by Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. For Yahweh who created the heavens, he is God, Elohim, almighty creator, who formed the earth and made it. He who established it says this, I am Yahweh and there is no one else. Assemble yourselves and come, come together, you survivors of the nations. They are ignorant to carry around their wooden idols in religious processions or into battle and keep on praying to a God that cannot save them. Who announced this rise of Cyrus and his conquests long before it happened? Who declared it long ago? Was it not I, Yahweh? And there is no other God besides me a consistently and uncompromisingly just and righteous God and a saviour. There is no one except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, El meaning strength, and there is no other. Phew! Wow! What a powerful scripture. In a future episode, when we get to the sixth seal of the book of Revelation, when God's judgment hits the earth in a mighty and terrifying way at the start of the great tribulation, the angels in heaven described in scripture as massive armies that accompany Yahweh proclaim in a deafening and resounding war cry shout in Hebrew over and over again, En O Brador which means there is nobody else but him. There is no other God but Yahweh. And in an end time prophecy from Ezekiel that speaks about this moment, you hear Yahweh make the same resounding and powerful statement where he says, and the whole world will know that I am God. I am Yahweh Elohim, and there is no other God but me. Sure, I just had to stop recording there for a moment because as I was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on me with such an anointing that I couldn't speak anymore. And um, it was really an amazing and wonderful experience. And 
the prayer of my heart is that his anointing would flow through you to all of you that are listening. And uh, I can only encourage you to stick with me right to the end of this video, because where this is leading is absolutely profound. But coming to the teaching again, when King Cyrus conquered Babylon, as I was saying, to his astonishment, he encountered this letter that was written to him one and a half centuries earlier by the prophet Isaiah, which specifically addressed him by name, described his spe spectacular career of how Yahweh would help him conquer all the nations. And the instruction to Cyrus from Yahweh to free the Hebrew captives so that they could return to Israel and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and their temple. And in his astonishment at this letter, King Cyrus did exactly that, which was documented 2 Chronicles 36, verse 22 to 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may Yahweh his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but I just find this whole thing, this whole story, absolutely incredible and phenomenal. And we're only just getting started. There's so much more of this incredible story still to unfold. But just stop a moment and let the reality of what has really happened here sink in. 150 years in advance, Yahweh gives a letter to King Cyrus through the prophet Isaiah. And Yahweh uses a pagan king who's in the highest levels of the occult, a type and shadow of the Antichrist, a total unbeliever who does not know him to fulfill his purpose, and at the same time make a worldwide public declaration that Yahweh is God. And if you look in the original Hebrew text of this verse, Cyrus did acknowledge and call Yahweh by his name, Yahweh. You see it here. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And you see it again in this verse here, where King Cyrus says, And he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may Yahweh his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem. So King Cyrus acknowledges Yahweh by his name. And the reality of Yahweh is demonstrated through the fulfillment of this prophecy, through Isaiah and through Jeremiah, as history unfolded exactly as scripture foretold it would. And I can't help but read these powerful verses again. Who announced this rise of Cyrus and his conquests long before it happened? Who declared it long ago? Was it not I, Yahweh? And there is no other God besides me, a consistently and uncompromisingly just and righteous God and a saviour. There is no one except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the peoples of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So just as Yahweh foretold in scripture, the 70 year time period began with the first deportation of Hebrews to Babylon, which included Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego at the time of the first Babylonian siege of Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC. 
Miss lasted 70 years exactly to the day, using the prophetic 360-day year, ending in 536 BC in the biblical month of Nisan, which is the March-April period in the Gregorian calendar that the world uses, when the first group of Hebrew people returned to the land of Israel after the decree of King Cyrus. And interestingly, there was also another overlapping 70 year period between the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians in 586 BC and the completion of the rebuilding of the second temple by Zerubbabel in 516 BC. At this time, they had rebuilt the temple, but it would still be many years before they would completely rebuild Jerusalem. Now, every minuscule detail in the Word of God is intentionally there on purpose and has significance and meaning. So these two timelines that are first mentioned here are very important. The first 70-year timeline establishes a starting point for an incredible prophecy in Ezekiel, which I'm going to share with you later in this video that foretold 2,600 years in advance, the exact year when the nation of Israel would be restored in 1948. And incredibly, this first timeline also accurately points us to when the events of the book of Revelation would begin, which happened in 2019. And then the second 70 year timeline between the destruction of the first temple and restoration of the second temple establishes a starting point in the same prophecy in Ezekiel that foretold the exact year of the restoration of Jerusalem to the people of Israel in 1967. And it also seems to be pointing us to the timing of the end of the events of the book of Revelation when everything prophesied there will have taken place and already happened. So this foundation that I am presently taking a lot of time to establish is going to build up to some very, very interesting things that I'm going to open up to you from scripture and how it coincides with how history unfolded with mind blowing precision. So again, I encourage you to stick with me to the end of this video, even though you have to watch it in sections at a time, because this is where it's all leading to. It is taking time for me to build a solid foundation, but the teaching in this video is like a continuous crescendo in music, where it is building up and building up until a big, big wow, wow, wow revelation and it's going to end with a bang. So stick with me. I am sure you will agree with me when you get to the end of the video that the time invested to watch the whole thing carefully was well worth it. The same account of the Jews' joyous return to Israel after being set free by King Cyrus is also documented in Ezra chapter 1 where the prophecy of Jeremiah and Isaiah chapter 45 was fulfilled. Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that is the first year he ruled Babylon, in order to fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah the prophet, Yahweh stirred up and put into motion the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. In any place where a survivor, Jew Jewish exile, may live, let the men, the Gentiles of that place, support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with freewill offerings for the house of God, Elohim, in Jerusalem. 
Then the heads of the fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, all those whose spirits God had stirred up, arose to go up and rebuild the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem. All those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuable things, in addition to all that was given as a freewill offering. Also King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of Yahweh, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem when he captured that city and had put them in the house of his gods. So the prophecy of Jeremiah and Isaiah chapter 45 unfolded exactly as they both prophesied it would, as documented in 2 Chronicles 36 verse 22 to 23 and Ezra chapter 1, where after exactly 70 years of being in exile and captivity in Babylon, the people of Israel were restored to their land and could rebuild their temple. Also, in this incredible prophecy in Isaiah chapter 45, it foretells of a Messiah, Yeshua, who would come and provide salvation that would also not only be for the people of Israel, but would be spread to the Gentile nations as well. And the build-up towards those events, which we are going to see are the key pinpoints of the 70 weeks of Daniel prophetic timeline, begins with Yahweh using King Cyrus to set the Hebrew captives free to return to Israel so that they could rebuild Jerusalem and their temple. Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were a part of the first Hebrew people taken into captivity to Babylon, and they lived in Babylon throughout the entire 70-year punishment Yahweh had given Israel until the Hebrew people were released to return to the land of Israel in the first year of King Cyrus, as we see in Daniel 1 verse 21 which was the year Cyrus made a proclamation allowing the people of Israel to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. The year of this proclamation marked the end of the 70-year captivity of the people of Israel prophesied by Yahweh through Jeremiah. So Daniel lived to see the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the sudden rise of the Medo-Persian Empire with its first ruler, King Cyrus. So that background sets the stage for the context in which Daniel was given two extremely important prophecies in Daniel chapter 9. The first prophecy lasted 70 years, which is the prophecy we've just studied, and then the second prophecy covers 70 prophetic weeks. In reference to the first prophecy of 70 years, Daniel wrote in Daniel 9 verses 1 to 2, In the first year of Darius, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books the number of years which, according to the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the desolations which had been pronounced on Jerusalem would end, and it was 70 years. Daniel's mention of the books in this verse is a reference to the prophecies that Yahweh gave through Jeremiah just prior to the Babylonian invasion, where the first temple and Jerusalem would be destroyed and the people of Israel would go into captivity for 70 years. Daniel's recognition of how Yahweh was fulfilling the 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah had a profound effect on him. In Daniel chapter 9, just prior to the two key prophecies that were given to Daniel in that same chapter, you see the most beautiful way in which Daniel responded, which is a model for us in terms of our heart's response to Yahweh in the fire of the end times we are about to walk through where Daniel went into a time of fasting and repentance and seeking Yahweh in heartfelt, passionate prayer with all his soul and strength, 
confessing the sins of the nation of Israel and interceding for Yahweh's forgiveness, help and intervention. Let's read his prayer of repentance together, which is in the context of the well-known 21-day fast that Daniel went on. So I directed my attention to Yahweh to seek him by prayer and supplications, with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to Yahweh my God and confessed and said, O Yahweh, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and extends loving kindness towards those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed wrong and have behaved wickedly and have rebelled, turning away from your commandments and ordinances. Further, we have not listened to and heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Yahweh, but to us confusion and open shame, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the treacherous acts of unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Yahweh, to us belong confusion and open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To you, Yahweh our God, belong mercy and loving kindness and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, and we have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh our God by walking in his laws which he set before us through his servants the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law even turning aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, and the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Therefore Yahweh has kept the tragedy ready and brought it upon us. For Yahweh our God is uncompromisingly righteous and openly just in all his works which he does. He keeps his word, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Yahweh our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name, as it is today, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Yahweh, in accordance with all your righteous and just acts, please let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because of our sins and the wickedness of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of scorn and a contemptuous byword to all who are around us. Now, therefore, our God, listen to and heed the prayer of your servant Daniel and his supplications, and for your own sake let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, incline your ear to hear, open your eyes, and look at our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you because of our own merits and righteousness, but because of your great mercy and compassion. O Yahweh, hear. O Yahweh, forgive. O Yahweh, listen and take action. Do not delay for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. And it was in the context of this passionate, heartfelt prayer of repentance and time of fasting that Yahweh sent an answer to Daniel through the angel Gabriel. Daniel 9 verse 20 to 23 says, While I was still speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yahweh my God, while I was still speaking in prayer and extremely exhausted, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and he talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and wisdom and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command to give you an answer was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly regarded and greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the message and begin to understand the meaning of the vision. 
And here is the point where Daniel is given an extremely important 70-week prophetic timeline in which Yahweh begins to unfold his magnificent plan for mankind and lays the whole foundation for the Book of Revelation timeline, which we are now going to unpack in detail together, so that like Daniel, we can be given insight, wisdom, and understanding that will equip us to recognize where we are in biblical prophecy and discern the signs of the times we are presently in, in 2023, so that we can be equipped in all the ways that we need to be for the time ahead. In Daniel chapter 9, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel and gave him a timeline of the exact year that Yeshua the Messiah would arrive on the scene to provide the salvation promised in the prophecy of Isaiah we read earlier. And this is mind-blowing because we are once again going to see how history unfolded exactly according to what the Bible prophesied with pinpoint accuracy. In Daniel 9 verse 24, this is what the angel tells Daniel. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to stop their transgression, to put an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and he gives him a 70 week time frame in which the visions that he has been seeing will start happening and when they will be fulfilled. Then in verse 25, Gabriel specifically tells Daniel when the Messiah will arrive within the 70 week time frame. Know therefore and understand that from the decree to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, first of all, who is this ruler called the anointed one that this verse is speaking about? Well, if you look at the original Hebrew for the phrase anointed one in the scripture, it is the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means Messiah, the Messianic Prince, the King and High Priest of Israel. People refer to him as Jesus Christ. Christ is not his surname, it's a word used for his title. The word Christ in Greek means anointed one, but anointed what? The word Christ actually does not adequately translate the fullness of the title of who our Messiah is. As you can see here in the original Hebrew, he is our high priest and king. The full name for the Son of God is Yeshua HaMashiach, which means Yeshua the Messiah, who is our High Priest and King of Righteousness. There is plenty other scriptures to back that up. For example, Hebrews 4 verse 14 to 15, Psalm 110 verse 4, Malachi 4 verse 2, Revelation 19 verse 16, just to name a few examples. So if you really want an extremely powerful weapon in spiritual warfare, when you need healing, his supernatural protection, supernatural provision, etc. in the hard times ahead, I encourage you to use his proper full name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, our High Priest and King. So it is clear here that when Daniel 9 verse 25 says the Anointed One, it is referring to the Messiah who is going to come. And the angel Gabriel then explained where in the 70 week time frame he had given Daniel the Messiah would come. He said that the time period from when the decree is made to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah, arrives on the scene will be seven weeks plus 62 weeks, which is a total of 69 weeks. So what pinpoints the start of this timeline 
is when the decree was sent out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And that did indeed happen. It is described in Ezra chapter 6 and 7 and in Nehemiah chapter 2. But when it happened has been a matter of debate amongst biblical scholars, because there are at least three decrees in the book of Ezra. The first decree was that of Cyrus in 537 BC, which we just learned about, where he said the people of Israel are free to go back to Judah and Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But in that decree, there was no mention of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, which is what the angel Gabriel specifically said. And there was especially no mention of rebuilding the wall, which was almost the definition of a city back then. The second decree is that of Darius in Ezra 6 verse 1 to 12 in about 518 BC, which was essentially a renewal of Cyrus's decree to rebuild the temple. But again, there was no mention of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. The third decree in Ezra was that of King Artaxerxes, which is described in Ezra 6 verse 8 Ezra 7 verse 11 to 28 and Nehemiah 2 verses 1 to 18, which was a decree to rebuild the temple as well as the city of Jerusalem. And so it makes the most sense that this was the decree that the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel was specifically referring to, because it was this decree that actually resulted in the rebuilding of the wall and the city of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah, and so it was this third decree that actually resulted in the rebuilding of the temple and the city of Jerusalem taking place. And by the end of the video, I will show you a lot more solid evidence that we are on the right track in using this third degree, a decree, as we see several other prophetic puzzle pieces interconnect with us and fit together and fall into place. According to Ezra 7 verse 8, the decree comes from the seventh year of King Artaxerxes and several historical documents and archaeological findings confirm that the date King Artaxerxes of Persia made a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and their temple was in 457 BC. So the angel Gabriel said, that in the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, from 457 BC, when the decree was given to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, there would be 69 weeks until the Messiah comes. 69 weeks is 483 days. Now, when it comes to timelines in biblical prophecy, there is often a prophetic code that is involved, which you have to apply to see how that prophecy is fulfilled. Sometimes a day literally means a day, as in 24 hours. Sometimes a day can also refer to a thousand years, as we saw earlier. For example, in 2 Peter 3 verse 8, it says that with Yahweh, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And then in some prophecies, like this one in Daniel that we are presently looking at, one day is equivalent to one year. Here are two examples of scripture that mentions this prophetic code of one day representing one year. Ezekiel 4 verse 6, I have assigned to you 40 days, a day for each year. Numbers 14 verse 34, because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sins. So in the 70 week timeline of Daniel, to see how this prophecy is fulfilled, all we need to do is apply the day to year prophetic code by converting 483 days to 483 years. So let's see what year in the timeline we fall on 
if we add 483 years from 457 BC, when the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple was sent out. That takes us to 27 AD. Now you have to be careful here because when counting years that cross over between BC and AD, zero is not actually a year, so you don't count that. And that's why you land on 27 AD and not 26 AD. So let's see if there is anything significant that happened in 27 AD. We are very spoiled with technology nowadays in terms of how almost any information is available to us at the tips of our fingers with just a few clicks of a button on the internet. In putting together these teachings, I use a website called the Bible Hub, which is very useful in many different ways. The Bible Hub has a chronology website where they have gathered the information of dates of significant biblical events from many reputable historians and academic sources and put it all together for us to have in one place on this site. And it's an incredibly valuable resource. So if you scroll down on this website, until you get to 27 AD, look what happens here. Right at the beginning of 27 AD, Yeshua fasts in the desert for 40 days where he is tempted. Then he calls his first disciples, does his first miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana, and he begins his ministry and starts doing the work of the kingdom. So the Messiah did indeed arrive on the scene in 27 AD which marked the beginning of his ministry exactly 483 years after the decree was sent out to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, exactly as was prophesied in the 70-week timeline in Daniel. Now there is a reason that those 483 years were specifically divided into seven weeks and then 62 weeks because something significant happened after seven weeks. Seven weeks is 49 days, which in this prophetic code represents 49 years. Now, from what you've learned so far in this video, does the number 49 ring a bell in your mind? Remember the Jubilee principle? After seven cycles of seven years, which was 49 years, Next came the 50th year, which was a jubilee, in which people's land and inheritance was restored. So I'm just pointing out to you how you see these same biblical patterns throughout the prophetic calendar. And I was saying that there is a reason that those 483 years were specifically divided into seven weeks and then 62 weeks, because something significant happened after seven weeks. Seven weeks is 49 days, which in this prophetic code represents 49 years. 49 years after 457 BC is 408 BC, and history says that in 408 BC, Jerusalem was finally rebuilt and the people's land and inheritance was fully restored to them as we see in the pattern of the Jubilee principle in the 50th year after 49 years. So the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem was sent out in 457 BC, and in 408 BC, the rebuilding of Jerusalem was completed, and that is the significance of that first seven prophetic weeks. Now let's have a look at what happens in the very significant final prophetic week or final seven years of the 70 week timeline in Daniel's prophecy. Daniel 9 verse 26. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death 
and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. So right here, it is prophesied about Yeshua's crucifixion, where the Messiah would be put to death. And then in the English translation, it says that he will have nothing. That's not a very good translation because the important meaning was lost. So let's go back and look at this in the original Hebrew on the Bible Hub website. And here we see that it says that the Messiah will be put to death or cut off, but not for himself. So taking those words from the original Hebrew, this scripture really reads like this. After the 62 sevens, the Messiah will be put to death, but not for himself. Wow. Why would it say that? Because Yeshua did not die for himself, he died for you and me. He paid the price for our sins so that by his blood that he shed on the cross, we could be saved. So this 70 week prophetic timeline in Daniel said that around 27 AD, the Messiah would come and begin his ministry and then he would be put to death. And Daniel chapter nine, verse 27, prophesies of exactly what year the Messiah will be crucified. And this is really important to establish because the year that Yeshua was crucified is a key pinpoint on the biblical timeline that shows us where we are on the biblical time clock. And later this key pinpoint in combination with puzzle pieces from other biblical end time prophecies will show us where we are on the book of Revelation timeline. Daniel 9 verse 27 says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, other translations say on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, verse 27 is a follow on from the previous verses. So the he in the scripture is still referring to the same person, the Messiah, the anointed one, who will confirm a covenant with many for one seven or one prophetic week. Then it says that in the middle of the week, the Messiah will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Why would Yeshua the Messiah put an end to sacrifice and offering? Hebrews 10 verse 11 to 13 gives us the answer. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua the Messiah once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the Messiah had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10 verse 11 to 13 explains that Yeshua fulfilled all the requirements of the law by becoming the ultimate final sacrifice once and for all for our sins. And that is why he put an end to sacrifice and offerings in the temple when he died for us on the cross. And in this verse in Daniel 9 verse 27, it says exactly what year Yeshua would die on the cross and put an end to sacrifice and offerings in the middle of that final week. In other words, in the middle of that final seven year period. So it says that the death of the Messiah will take place in the middle of the week. So in the middle of that final seven year period after 27 AD, we should see when his crucifixion took place, resulting in an end to sacrifice and offerings. 
in the middle of seven years is three and a half years. So he arrived on the scene in the very beginning of 27 AD. So three and a half years later puts us in the middle of 30 AD. What happened in 30 AD? Well, if you go to the Bible Chronology website, you see that Yeshua was crucified in 30 AD. There's been a long debate among some biblical scholars about the exact year that Yeshua was crucified, where they have argued that it could have been anywhere between 29 AD to 33 AD. But thankfully, there are multiple witnesses in scripture and in historical writings outside the Bible that add a lot of solid and in fact undeniable evidence to 30 AD being the year that Yeshua died on the cross. And I'm going to share some of that evidence with you at the end of this video, as it is absolutely mind blowing and tremendously exciting. But let's first finish unpacking the meaning of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, which lays the first foundation with key historical pinpoints for our Book of Revelation timeline. In spite of the debate in some circles of the exact year Yeshua was crucified, with numerous historical sources, references and archaeological evidences, most historians agree that Yeshua was killed in 30 AD. Not all historians believe that Yeshua is the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead, but most historians agree from the evidence that Yeshua existed and that he was killed in 30 AD. So there we see it on the timeline. Three and a half years after Yeshua started his ministry, he was crucified in 30 AD. The exact time frame the Daniel prophecy in the Old Testament said that he would die. It's all there with pinpoint accuracy. This is not something that any man can make up. One date falling exactly into place can be a coincidence, but all these dates falling exactly into place with such precision hundreds of years later just by random chance has a mathematical probability that is so astronomical it's actually impossible, implying that it is nothing short of supernatural. And it doesn't stop there. There's several more prophetic dates that fall exactly into place in this timeline. So let's carry on because in the end, you're really going to see how absolutely phenomenal this truly is. And eventually, it's going to become extremely relevant to us in terms of orientating us to where we are right now. But first, there's something that I just want to point out. In Daniel 9 verse 27, when you look at the other possible Hebrew translation of the temple mentioned here, it mentions the wing of the temple, which is where Yeshua was crucified, which was opposite the temple on the Mount of Olives. Because remember, when the guards pierced Yeshua's side to ensure that he died, from where they were at the foot of the cross, they were able to see into the entrance of the temple and they could see the veil that was torn in two at that moment that Yeshua died. Most people think that the temple was in the place where the golden dome of the Muslim temple is currently situated. But this big area here was actually a fortress for the Roman soldiers. The real temple was actually near where the city of David was, outside this area where the Roman fortress was, opposite the Ophel Gardens. So on the other side of the road is where the city of David was, where the temple was really located, which is somewhere in this area here. And somewhere near the slope over here is where the Garden of Gethsemane really was. It's not the official tourist site they take you to in Israel. One could actually spend a whole hour proving that this was the proper site for the temple from scripture, which unfortunately I don't have the time to do right now. 
but God willing, maybe I'll do another video explaining this fully later on. It's not really important to the overall message, but nevertheless, it is interesting. But here is where the high priest Caiaphas' house was. It's a historical place that you can go and visit in Israel today. I've been there. Below the high priest Caiaphas' house, there is a dungeon with jails, which you can see in these photos what it looks like. This is where Yeshua was questioned by the Pharisees. And then just next door, there are these holes that prisoners would be pushed through, including Yeshua himself, and they would fall three meters onto the hard, solid rock floor of this room, which is a square room carved into stone, where the floor and walls are just solid rock. And when you stand in there, it's an amazing feeling because that is one room where Yeshua definitely was. It is a definite, solidly established and proven fact. This is where he spent the night before he was crucified. And you can feel the coldness of the cold stone rock, the loneliness, the suffering a person would have gone through in there when you stand in that room. But coming to the point by Caiaphas's house is where Yeshua was in the courtyard when Peter denied him three times. Remember, Yeshua had said to Peter, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Now, the cock was not a chicken crowing. The cock was the name of the person in the temple who had the duty of blowing the shofar to wake up the people on duty in the temple. And if the temple was situated here by the Golden Dome, it would have not have been possible for Peter and the disciples in the courtyard to hear the shofar blown by the cock in the temple early at sunrise. Also, if the temple was situated here by the Golden Dome, the guards at the foot of the cross would have not been able to see directly into the temple. But in this location, where you can see the city of David, where the temple really was, right opposite that, on the Mount of Olives near these trees here, is where Yeshua was most likely to have been crucified, in a position where the soldiers at the foot of the cross would have been able to look directly into the temple and see the veil torn in two. And as was the custom in those days, he was crucified by the corner of the road, which was the same busy road in Yeshua's day over here, because it was a form of humiliation to hang naked next to a busy road where everybody was passing. So Yeshua was crucified around this spot here on the Mount of Olives, which was the real Golgotha site, which was on the wing of the temple as Daniel 9 verse 27 says, where you could see directly into the temple. Unfortunately, many of the tourist sites that they take people to, where they say that Yeshua was crucified, where the tomb was where he was buried, and where other significant biblical events took place, are not the true sites. They are unfortunately the sites which are sadly significant to the occultic, demonic, satanic, pagan gods of the beast kingdoms of Satan, of Babylon, Rome, Freemasonry, etc. Coming back to Daniel 9 verse 26, it says that the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We already established earlier that the ruler here is the anointed one, the Messiah, and it says that his people will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who are the people of the Messiah? Well, he is the descendant of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of the Jews. So the Jews are his people. Of course, we know that no matter what race or nationality we come from, when we accept him as our savior, we are grafted in and we are all his people. But in the context of this specific scripture, 
It is referring to the Jews, which is the bloodline that he came from, who are his people that killed him. And this prophecy is going to show us how that resulted in the destruction of the city Jerusalem and the sanctuary, which was their second temple. Let's read Daniel 9 verse 27 again. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, and in the middle of the seven he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The interpreters give the second part in Daniel 9 verse 27 another interpretation in their footnotes that better matches the original Hebrew text. And it reads, At the wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on the desolated city. So verse 26 says, that the Jewish people will destroy the city. And in verse 27, it, it explains how they will destroy the city by setting up an abomination that causes desolation. In other words, an abomination that results in destruction being poured out on the city so that the city will become desolate. Now you may be thinking, hold on, the abomination that causes desolation is something that happens with the Antichrist in the end times. Yes, it is. But the final seven years of the book of Revelation is a mirror of what happens with Yeshua, our Messiah, in the final 70th week of the book of Daniel. So hold on and just be patient whilst I'm busy building the foundation that leads up to all of that. So then let's explore what that abomination is that results in the sanctuary, which was their second temple, and their city Jerusalem eventually being destroyed. Deuteronomy 21 verse 22 to 23 says, If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is executed and you hang his body on a tree, you must not leave the body on the tree overnight, but you must be sure to bury him that day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not defile and desecrate the land that Yahweh your God is giving you as an inheritance. So this scripture says that when a person is hanging on a wooden pole or a tree, that is a curse. And when things are not done properly according to God's word, it can result in the land being desecrated and defiled. The people of Israel were given the land of Israel as their inheritance. And so if they defile the land, it will bring a curse which will lead to its destruction so that the land becomes desolate. Yeshua was innocent, a man without sin, but they rejected him and chose to put him to death by hanging him on a cross. And Acts 5 verse 30 says, the God of our fathers raised up Yeshua, whom you have killed by hanging him on a tree. Galatians 3 verse 13 referenced Deuteronomy 21 verse 22 to 23, when it spoke of Yeshua dying for us on the cross. It says, but Christ has redeemed and rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. In Daniel 9 verse 27, it says that the Messiah himself will set up this abomination that causes desolation. Because as Galatians 3 verse 13 says, he willfully chose to become the curse. His life wasn't taken from him, he gave his life so that we could be saved and set free from sin and restored to a relationship with Abba Father through what Yeshua did for us on the cross. We know that God had a plan in allowing his son to be put to death, but the Jewish people are still accountable for what they did. The Jewish people at the time committed one of the greatest abominations by murdering and crucifying the Messiah, the Son of God. 
And the moment that the first drop of his blood splashed onto the ground, the spilling of his blood brought a curse on their land, which we are now going to see led to the destruction of their city Jerusalem and their sanctuary, the temple. And this is where we now need to go to the prophecy of Jonah to get another important piece of the puzzle. The stories within the Old Testament all point to Yeshua in some way. By containing prophetic parallels, which are foreshadows of significant events that would take place in Yeshua's life and significant things that would happen in his first coming and in his second coming. For example, the story of Abraham when he was about to sacrifice Isaac and instead was given a lamb was a foreshadow of what Yeshua, the sinless spotless lamb of God, would do on the cross. And those stories in the Old Testament, which have foreshadows that are prophetic parallels of Yeshua, also contain prophecy about significant future events. And we are going to see a very interesting example of this in the story of Jonah. And this is going to give us a very important piece of the puzzle concerning the timeline that we are building which will eventually show us where we are in the end times and help us understand the timeline of the book of Revelation. So a quick revision of the story of Jonah, which is told in the book of Jonah in the Bible. Around 760 BC, Jonah was a prophet of God. And the story begins with Yahweh calling Jonah to deliver a message of warning to the people of Nineveh, where the people were living a lifestyle of sin similar to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now at that time, Nineveh was a great nation in the world, similar to the great nation that the superpower of America is today. And the message Jonah had to give them was that they need to repent Otherwise, Yahweh will completely destroy the entire city and nation of Nineveh in 40 days. Now imagine if you had to go to the American government, an entire nation of America today, and warn them to repent. Otherwise, God's judgment is going to fall and their cities and their entire nation will be destroyed. That's quite a daunting task. And so that is what it was like to be in Jonah's shoes, being given such a task from Yahweh. So I personally can empathize more than you know with how Jonah felt in wanting to run away from having to do that. Because giving such a message of warning to a great nation like that is not easy. And so initially, in response to that, Jonah runs in the opposite direction. He gets on a boat that is going in the opposite direction of where God told him to go and sails away. Well, you can't run away from God. So God sends a massive storm and the people in the boat are in great distress because they know that they are not going to survive this fierce storm and that their boat is most likely going to sink. Jonah knows that all that is happening is his fault because of his disobedience to God. So he explains that to the people and agrees to let them throw him overboard so that the boat and the rest of the people can be saved. As Jonah is thrown overboard, he begins to anticipate death. But thank goodness we serve a God of second chances. Out of nowhere, a huge fish, which we presume is something like a whale, swallows Jonah and Jonah is in the whale for three days and three nights. Then God makes the whale spit Jonah out and he ends up on land. And I always wondered how realistic that part of the story could really be, or if it is something purely supernatural that happened. But interestingly, there is a documentary on 60 Minutes Australia of the true story and testimony of a man who was accidentally swallowed live by a whale in the sea and he lived to tell the story. 
So this event with Jonah being swallowed by a whale or some type of big fish is not so far-fetched. But there is a part of Jonah's story that is supernatural, as it does seem that Jonah died during those three days and three nights in the whale. As he said in Jonah 2 verse 2, I called out to Yahweh out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. The Hebrew meaning of Sheol is a place in hell which is the realm of the dead. I have personally listened to several testimonies of people who died and went to hell and experienced different parts of being in hell, and then came back to life with the mandate given to them by Yeshua to share the realities of what they saw in their life after death experience. And many of them speak about how hell is in the center or belly of the earth. So whilst Jonah's body was in the belly of the whale and he died, his spirit went to Sheol, where he was also in the belly of the earth. So when God made the whale spit Jonah out onto the land, he raised Jonah from the dead as well. So after going through an ordeal like that, Jonah is now ready to go deliver God's prophetic message of warning to the city of Nineveh. And all he simply says is repent or your city will be destroyed in 40 days. And what I find quite incredible is that the people actually believed him. And without asking any questions, the king and all the people did exactly as Jonah said, and they repented with genuine heartfelt sincerity and even went on a fast and stopped all the evil sinful ways of Babylon that they had previously been involved in. And as a result, they were spared from God's judgment and their city was not destroyed in 40 days. Now every detail in this story is significant, including the numbers. So let's see how the details in the story of Jonah all point to Yeshua and provide evidence and undeniable proof of who he is as the Messiah. As Yeshua traveled through Israel, teaching and preaching, there were many that believed in him as they witnessed his great miracles that he performed as he healed the sick and shared the message of the gospel with them. But there were also many who did not believe in him, especially the legalistic religious leaders of the day, who were always criticizing and trying to find fault with him. And Yeshua is about to reveal himself in the story of Jonah as he answers one of the religious leaders' questions, demanding that he show them a sign to prove that he is who he says he is, the Messiah and Son of God. We read about this in Matthew 12, verses 39 to 40. But Yeshua replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart or belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So in these verses, Yeshua shows them how the story of Jonah prophetically foreshadows who he is. He explains that just like Jonah was inside the belly of a whale, whilst his spirit was in Sheol for three days and three nights, in the same way, after Yeshua allows himself to be sacrificed and crucified on the cross for the sins of the world, so would Yeshua also be in hell, in the belly or heart of the earth, for three days and three nights. And on the third day, just like God raised Jonah from the dead out of the fish, God will raise Yeshua up out of, out of the grave. And he tells them that is the greatest sign they will ever see that proves who he is. When he is raised up from the dead, on the third day, just like Jonah. Yeshua said in Luke 11 verse 30, What happened to Jonah 
was a sign to the people of Nineveh that God had sent him. What happens to the Son of Man will be a sign to these people that he was sent by God. So here we have established that the story of Jonah is a prophetic parallel of Yeshua. And in the story of Jonah, there is also a clue of a prophetic warning to the people. And that warning is where the numbers in the story are significant. And this is where it gets very interesting. We've already seen the connection between the three days and three nights of Jonah's body being in the belly of the whale and Yeshua's body being in the grave and both of them being in the realm of the dead in hell in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Yeshua is really just all over the story of Jonah and one could really dig into the story of Jonah and point out lots of parallels between Jonah and Yeshua for several hours. But the important thing I want to show you that is relevant to the prophetic timeline that we are building is the significance of the number 40 in Jonah's warning. Remember Jonah said to Nineveh, repent or in 40 days your city will be destroyed. Both Jonah and Yeshua carried a message from Yahweh to a city to repent. Jonah preached to the city of Nineveh and Yeshua preached to the city of Jerusalem. And when Yeshua was in a heated discussion with the religious leaders who were criticizing him, notice what Yeshua said to them in Matthew 12 verse 41. The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. But now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Here Yeshua was warning the people and saying to them, listen to me, repent, or the same thing that would have happened to Nineveh will happen to you. The people who Jonah preached to listened to him, and because they repented, their city was saved. But the people who Yeshua preached to did not listen to him or repent. Instead, they rejected him and crucified him. And since Yeshua is a parallel of Jonah, that means that in history, we should see something that happened to Jerusalem, which was the city of those who refused to listen to Yeshua's warning to repent. Jonah said to the Ninevites that if they don't listen to him and repent, their city would be destroyed in 40 days. That number 40 represents a prophetic time frame until destruction will come as a part of God's judgment on the city. And this is where we will see another example of what the Bible describes as a day-to-year prophetic code, which is a parallel where the number of days that something happened in the past relates to the number of years something will happen in the future, just like we saw in the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. So Yeshua went to preach to Jerusalem, and unlike in the story of Jonah, they refused to repent and they rejected him. And guess what happened to the city of Jerusalem 40 years later? Well, we already know that Yeshua was killed in 30 AD. And 40 years later is 70 AD. And when you look at history, you will see that the single largest event that happened to the Jewish people was the fall of Jerusalem during the Roman invasion where the Romans came and destroyed its walls and completely overturned and burnt the city and completely annihilated its temple. Yeshua prophesied that this destruction would be so severe that not one stone would be left standing on top of another. Matthew 24 verse 1 to 2 Yeshua left the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the magnificent and massive buildings of the temple. And he said to them, do you see all of these things? I assure you and most solemnly say to you, 
Not one stone here will be left on top of the other, which will not be torn down. At the time when Yeshua prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, everybody was safe and at peace in the land of Israel and enjoying their glorious temple. And nobody could imagine that the magnificent and massive buildings that the disciples pointed out to Yeshua would one day be destroyed, or that it would ever be possible that they would lose their temple, their city, and their land. No one would have thought such a thing, but it did happen. And it is an absolute historical fact that the date that Jerusalem was destroyed was in 70 AD, and this is mind-blowing. And this puzzle piece from the prophecy of Jonah is also one of our confirmations that we are on the right track in unpacking the mystery and meaning of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, which also foretold the time of the coming Messiah, which we established was in 30 AD. 30 AD plus 40 years takes us to 70 AD, and it is a very solidly established historical date with lots of evidence outside of the Bible that the temple and Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So that brings a lot of solid confirmation that we are on the right track with very good accuracy regarding these dates on this timeline. So this is one piece of historical evidence that ties in with scripture, which gives reassurance that 30 AD is in fact the correct date Yeshua was crucified, and that there is not the possibility that maybe there is some kind of error in the way history was recorded or some kind of error in the calendar because of this piece of the puzzle that has been brought into the picture from the prophecy of Jonah, which said that exactly 40 years after Yeshua was crucified, judgment would come and the city would be destroyed, and 40 years before 70 AD is 30 AD. And just to remind you where I am ultimately going, where the book of Revelation timeline is concerned, I'm taking a lot of time to prove from scripture and history the year that Yeshua was crucified, because it is a major key pinpoint on the biblical clock that reorientates us to where we are in biblical prophecy and where we are in time right now. Because when you know when all the events took place around his first coming, there is over 42 other prophetic scriptures that then show us the timing of the events surrounding his second coming, which is 2000 years later. So 2000 years later from 30 AD takes us to 2030 AD, which means that somewhere approximately around the season of 2030, the rapture and then the great tribulation, which ends with Yeshua returning on his white horse with heaven's armies, which is his worshiping warrior bride riding with him to defeat the Antichrist and remove Satan and sin from this earth, will have all already happened somewhere approximately around then. So that is the bigger picture of where we are heading and part of the relevance of all that I'm sharing now. But the significance of what we have uncovered so far is huge. The fact that the city of Jerusalem was destroyed exactly 40 years after Yeshua was crucified provides solid undeniable historical evidence that proves who Yeshua is, that he is the Messiah. Fragments of the book of Jonah were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so that proves that Jonah and all its prophecies was written hundreds of years before Yeshua was born. And history has unfolded exactly as the book of Jonah in the Old Testament said it would. The book of Jonah foretold that Yeshua's body would be in the grave for three days and three nights, which did indeed happen. And again, remember what Yeshua said in Luke 11 verse 30. What happened to Jonah was a sign to the people of Nineveh that God had sent him. 
what happens to the Son of Man will be a sign to these people that he was sent by God. And then the book of Jonah had a prophetic warning that if the people rejected God's messenger, their city would be destroyed after a period of 40. And history shows us that in fact Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, exactly 40 years after they killed Yeshua in 30 AD. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says, The secret things belong to Yahweh our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Proverbs 25 verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. By digging into scripture, and carefully examining prophecy in the story of Jonah and comparing it with how history unfolded, we can see that, wow, the whole thing was foretold with absolute accuracy, not only in the book of Jonah, but also in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. And it proves that Yeshua was in fact God's messenger and that he is the Messiah. But if that's not enough evidence for you, well, I'm just getting started. By the end of this video, I'm going to show you enough evidence that Yeshua is the Messiah, that the mathematical odds of it not being so are so astronomical that it's impossible to even put the number on the screen. So coming back to the 70 weeks of Daniel timeline, in 457 BC, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was sent out. Seven weeks later, which is 49 days, prophetically representative of 49 years later, Jerusalem was rebuilt. Then 62 prophetic weeks later, at 27 AD, the anointed one, the Messiah arrives on the scene and Yeshua starts his ministry. Three and a half years later, in 30 AD, he is crucified and this marks the time of the clock towards when the city will be destroyed. And exactly as Jonah's prophecy foretold, history confirms that exactly 40 years after Yeshua was crucified, the temple and Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And after that, the temple became desolate and Jerusalem became desolate, just as Daniel 9 verse 26 foretold and Daniel 9 verse 27 foretold. Many of the Jews were killed and many were taken into captivity and they were scattered to the nations. Yeshua knew that his death and the crucifixion of his body would be the abomination that would result in the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the physical temple in Jerusalem. And so he warned the people and he let them know in Matthew 24, verse 1 to 2, as we read earlier. Now, what is interesting is that when Yeshua spoke of the destruction of the temple, he was referring to two things at the same time. He was prophesying about the destruction of the physical temple, which happened in 70 AD. But the main thing he was talking about was the destruction of the ultimate true temple, which was his own body, the body of Christ. For example, in John chapter 2, as always, Yeshua was in a debate with the religious leaders of the day. And in verses 18 to 22, it says, on account of this, the Jews demanded, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do these things? Yeshua answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. This temple took 46 years to build, the Jews replied, and you are going to raise it up in three days? But Yeshua was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, 
his disciples remembered that he had said this. Then they believed the scripture and the word that Yeshua had spoken. So when Yeshua spoke of the temple that was to be destroyed and raised up in three days, he was talking about the temple, which is his body, that would be destroyed on the cross. And then three days later, that temple, his body, was raised up from the dead. But at the time, they all thought he was talking about the literal physical temple that was in Jerusalem. And so, for example, when Yeshua was being questioned before the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders who were trying to come up with every accusation they could think of to justify the agenda they were trying to push, which was to have him killed, this was one of the things that they came up with. Matthew 26, verse 61. Now the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were seeking false testimony against Yeshua in order to put him to death, but, th but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. This is also described in Mark 14, verse 58. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. So on the one hand, Yeshua was letting the people know that the literal physical temple would be destroyed, as we saw in Matthew 24, verse 1. But then the entire time, he was also talking about the true temple of God, which is not made with human hands. John 2, verse 21. But Yeshua was speaking about the temple of his body. And you know what is really ironic? Is when Yeshua was on the cross dying for the world, it says in Matthew 27, verse 39 to 40, the people passing by shouted abuse and hurled insults at him, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. And whilst they were mocking him, saying, You said you would destroy the temple, and now look at you, ha ha. They did not realize that that is exactly what he was doing. He was destroying the temple right there in front of their faces on that cross. And just like he promised, he raised it again in three days. How awesome is that? So at the three and a half year midpoint at Yeshua's crucifixion, the abomination of desolation took place in the true temple of God, the body of Christ, which was destroyed on the cross. And now, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17 says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of fire on the disciples. And when we become born again, we can also become filled with his Holy Spirit. And therefore, we are living tabernacles. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And at that point, the physical temple made with stones and human hands became a temple of flesh, which is your body and my body. And the physical fleshly bodies of all of those who are born again that make up the body of Christ which is a temple not made with human hands. And so, just like Ezekiel prophesied would happen in Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 28, the physical temple made with stones became a temple of flesh. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, 
and to carefully observe my ordinances, then they will be my people and I will be their God. So hopefully the scripture has opened up in a deeper revelation of meaning for many of you. There's one more interesting and very significant point on this timeline, the meaning and revelation of which we still need to unpack and discover. The prophecy of Daniel is 70 weeks in total. And we have been looking at the final 70th week, which represents the final seven years of this prophetic time frame. At the beginning of the seven years, in 27 AD, we saw the Messiah arrive on the scene. And then in the middle, at the three and a half year midpoint in 30 AD, we have seen that he was crucified. And then what happened at the end of the seven year period? Well, to see the significance of that, we need to first go back to Daniel 9 verse 27, which refers to this final seven year period. It says he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Now, first of all, what covenant with many is this scripture talking about that the Messiah would bring? Well, Yeshua said what it was in Mark 14, verse 24. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. In another translation, it says it like this. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. So Daniel 9 verse 27 said that the Messiah would confirm a covenant with many. And in Mark 14 verse 24, we see that this covenant that Yeshua was talking about that he would bring was the love covenant of salvation through his blood shed on the cross that provided forgiveness of sins when we repent so that we could be reconciled in our relationship with Abba Father through what Yeshua did for us. When Yeshua was having the last supper with his disciples, which by the way, was on the evening of Passover, where they were celebrating the Passover meal together. So note, Jesus himself, Yeshua himself, is celebrating the biblical feasts. The biblical feast, which was prophetically symbolic of what he would do the next day on the day of Passover, when he died on the cross for us. And Yeshua said in Luke 22, verse 20, in the same way, after the, the, the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Hebrews 10 verse 14 to 16 says, Because by a single offering he has made perfect for all time those who are being sanctified. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their hearts and inscribe them on their minds. This new covenant that Yeshua would make with his people that would be written and inscribed on their hearts and minds was also prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 verse 31 to 33. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke, though I was a, a husband to them, declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and inscribe it on their hearts, and I will be their God, Elohim, and they will be my people. This same scripture from Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 33, was then also referenced in Hebrews 10, verse 8. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. 
I will put my laws in their minds and inscribe them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. The point of reading these three scriptures to you was to show you that it is a covenant that he first makes with Israel. So we see in Daniel that Yeshua would confirm a covenant with many, which was the love covenant of salvation that he provided through his blood on the cross. And it says that he will confirm this covenant for one seven, which is seven years. Now, why does it say that? Because we know that his covenant is eternal, not just for seven years. So let's just have a look at the significance of this which will finish off the 70-week timeline of Daniel. So at the beginning of this final seven-year period, Yeshua the Messiah arrives on the scene and begins his ministry sharing about this new covenant that he is bringing as he travels through many towns throughout Israel and preaches the gospel to the Jewish people of Israel. And in the middle of the seven, which is three and a half years later, he is crucified confirming the love covenant of salvation that he provided through his blood on the cross, and then he is raised again. And before his ascension into heaven, Yeshua gave his disciples the Great Commission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So the disciples begin the great commission given to them and start preaching the gospel throughout all Judea, Samaria, and throughout Israel. And then at the end of the seven year period, what do we land on? Seven years from 27 AD is 34 AD. What of relevant significance happened in 30 AD? Well, let's go back to the Bible Chronology website and see. In 30 AD, you have the conversion of Saul, who then became the Apostle Paul. And the reason this is so significant is because Paul is known as the Apostle to the Gentiles. Ephesians 3 verse 1 to 9 says, When I think of all of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Yeshua the Messiah, for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know, God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding the Messiah. God did not reveal it to previous generations. But now, by his Spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are a part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Yeshua the Messiah. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege 
of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in the Messiah. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. So when Paul was converted in 34 AD, that marked the pivotal pinpoint in the history timeline when the gospel was not just preached to the Jewish people of Israel, but when the gospel would now rapidly spread worldwide as it was now preached to the Gentiles in all nations. So in 34 AD, the covenant expanded from not just being for the Jewish people of Israel, but to all people as people of all tribes, races, languages, and nations began to hear the gospel message of salvation through Yeshua the Messiah, the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. So now this gives us another crucially important puzzle piece, because now not only has the book of Daniel so accurately prophesied when Yeshua the Messiah would arrive on the scene in 27 AD and correctly foretold the exact year when he would be crucified in 30 AD, but now the book of Daniel also gave a seven-year period after which the gospel would not only be for the Jewish people, but would be spread throughout all the nations of the earth. Just over 500 years beforehand, Daniel prophesied the whole thing. Wow. So as you can see, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel foretold the timing of all the significant events that took place surrounding Yeshua's first coming, which is prophetically represented by the first four biblical feasts. And as far as the timeline of the book of Revelations goes, this was an essential foundation. Because as I mentioned before, knowing the year that Yeshua was crucified, buried and resurrected, then enables us to know the timing or the season of all the events that will take place surrounding his second coming. As Yeshua said in Matthew 24 verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. In future episodes, I am going to show you a key prophetic code to the timeline in a prophecy by Hosea, Zechariah, and a multitude of other scriptures with prophetic parallels and patterns that show us that it will be 2,000 years between the events of Yeshua's first coming and his second coming, where that is the amount of time that is given to preach the gospel to the whole world, and then the end comes, as Yeshua said. So the year that Yeshua was crucified is really a key pinpoint on the timeline to establish. Now, just to fully appreciate how awesome Yahweh's word is, let's just take some time to see how all his prophetic patterns connect in what we have covered so far. I'm going to begin with just a brief few minutes reminder of the Jubilee principle I explained earlier in this video. Remember, I explained that everything in the Bible, and especially in the book of Revelation, works in the patterns of seven. It started at creation in Genesis, where Yahweh worked creating the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he had a Sabbath rest. This is also a foreshadow of the bigger picture of the timeline of world history, where Yahweh has given a total of 6,000 years for mankind. And then the final 1,000 years, is what scripture calls the final millennium Sabbath rest, which begins when Yeshua comes with heaven's armies 
which is his worshipping warrior bride riding with him, to defeat the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the Tribulation, and Yeshua sets up his throne in Jerusalem, from where he will rule and reign on earth with his bride for a thousand years in the final seventh millennium Sabbath rest, which will be a time of peace and rest throughout the earth. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says, A day is like a thousand years to Yahweh, and a thousand years is like a day. So just as there are seven days in the creation week, so there is a total of 7,000 years in the overall biblical timeline. And then as it pertained to Abba Father's great agricultural wisdom, he gave another pattern of seven for his people to follow, where he instructed the people to work the farmlands in cycles of seven years, where in the same pattern of seven he set at creation. For six years the people could work the land and plant crops, and on the seventh year they weren't to plant anything because it was a Sabbath rest for both the land as well as the people. Then Yahweh explained that they must continue the seven-year pattern for seven cycles, in other words, seven times seven years, which equals a total of 49 years. And then the 50th year was an extra special year, which was also a Sabbath rest called a Jubilee. What was special and wonderful about a year of Jubilee is firstly all debts were cancelled and slaves were set free. So, for example, if somebody had lost their land and inheritance because of poverty and debt, that land would be returned to them on a jubilee year as all their debts were cancelled and they were set free. Yahweh set the lifespan of man to be 120 years in Genesis 6 verse 3. And in the same way, he gave a lifespan of 120 jubilees to mankind because 120 multiplied by 50 is 6,000 years. In the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy, we established that Yeshua was crucified in the year 30 AD in the Gregorian calendar that the world uses. In future episodes, we will see lots of evidence from scripture that from the time that Yeshua was crucified, it is 2,000 years later which is roughly approximately in the season somewhere around 2030 AD, when the 6,000 years given for mankind comes to an end, which is at the Battle of Armageddon, where Yeshua comes to defeat the Antichrist and remove Satan and sin from the earth at the sixth trumpet, which takes place at an exact hour, at an exact day, on an exact month, exactly ending the 6,000 years given to mankind. That year that this happens is a jubilee. It is the 120th jubilee. And exactly like what happened in the Old Testament, when the people's inheritance and their land was restored to them on a year of jubilee, so Yeshua is going to take his bride and his people back into the physical land of Israel. And he is going to set up his throne in Jerusalem, where, as I mentioned, he will rule and reign with his bride on earth for 1,000 years. So once again, in this final Jubilee year, the people of God are literally physically restored to their land of Israel. So whatever country you're living in now, just know that you've got an awesome future ahead to look forward to. If you are living a sanctified first love lifestyle of holiness, which doesn't mean perfection, it means that you've separated yourself from the things of the world in every area of your life, so that there is no more lukewarmness, fleshliness, worldliness, and compromise. And if you are walking in an intimate love relationship with him daily, then in the future, you're going to be living with him in his presence in the physical land of Israel for 1000 years. And I'll show you all the scriptures for that in a later episode.
But the point I want to show you for now is that if it is 2,000 years from the time that Yeshua was crucified until the end of the 6,000 years, that means that Yeshua was crucified in the year 4,000 on the biblical time clock. In other words, 4,000 years since the time of Adam. So if 30 AD was the year 4,000, then by doing the math, it means that 2030 is approximately the year 6,000, which then means that in 2023, we are approximately in the year 5,993, meaning that we are on the brink of, or already in, the season of the final seven years. Emphasizing the point I keep telling you in these videos, that now is the time that we better start paying attention to all that Abba Father told us about in the book of Revelation, because all the events prophesied there are just about to unfold. Now, as we look at the 7,000 year timeline, the year of Yeshua's death, burial and resurrection in his first coming was in exactly the year 4,000, which was a jubilee year. It was the 80th Jubilee because 80 multiplied by 50 years is 4,000. And remember what was the significance of him being crucified on a Jubilee year? Well, as per the Jubilee principle we read in Leviticus 25 verse 8 to 12, a Jubilee is where the person was set free from their debts. Their debts were cancelled. The slaves, the captives were set free and their inheritance that they had lost was restored to them. And that was a foreshadow of what Yeshua would do for us on the cross, where his blood shed for us, set us free from slavery to sin, and we were given the opportunity to be forgiven of our debts, in other words, forgiven of our sins, by applying his blood to our lives through repentance and through the salvation he gave us, he restored our inheritance to us in Christ as Matthew 6 verse 12 and Ephesians 1 verse 11 says. And just like Yeshua set his people free from sin through his work on the cross in his first coming, in his second coming he's going to completely set all the spiritual and physical captives free as he returns on a year of jubilee, which is the 120th jubilee, and removes Satan and sin from this earth in the battle of Armageddon, and literally takes his people back to the land of Israel, restoring their land and inheritance to them in its fullness. Now the Jubilee principle is loaded with prophetic meaning. There are so many golden nuggets and treasures in his word concerning the Jubilee principle in this prophetic timeline. And sometimes I've had a real difficult time in putting this teaching together because you know there's just so much amazing, mind-blowing stuff to share. Sometimes I just don't know which straw to pull first. But I'll have to save most of it for future episodes. But as briefly as I can, just while we look at the significance of Yeshua's first coming on the 80th Jubilee and his second coming on the 120th Jubilee, the story of Moses is also packed with prophetic parallels of Yeshua and his end time bride, which again we'll look at in lots more detail in future episodes. But for now, just a few short points. Moses was a type and shadow of Yeshua. Moses was 80 years old when he began his ministry of fulfilling his calling of setting God's people free from the slavery of Egypt. Where Egypt in scripture represents the bondage of the kingdom of darkness. In the same way, the Messiah came on the 80th Jubilee to set us free from the bondage and slavery of Egypt, which is setting us free from slavery to the devil and sin. The Egyptian pharaohs at the time the Israelites were in slavery were a type and shadow of Satan and the Antichrist. They even wore a serpent on their headdress, 
symbolizing the bondage and slavery of living in Satan's kingdom of darkness. Thinking, speaking, acting and living according to the image of the serpent who is the devil. With all the sicknesses and spiritual, psychological, emotional and physical bondages that come with it. Then Moses leading the Israelites through the Red Sea is a picture and foreshadow of us being set free by the blood of Yeshua on the cross. The Israelites then had to go on a wilderness journey for 40 years in the desert. This is equivalent to our journey of sanctification after salvation, which is basically the preparation process of becoming the bride that I explained in depth in the background video, which is freely available on YouTube and on our website called What It Practically Means to Be Ready When Jesus Returns to Fetch His Bride. Abba Father rescued his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But in the wilderness, he now needed to get Egypt out of the inside of them. Because they still had those mindsets from Egypt and the kingdom of darkness of, for example, grumbling, murmuring, complaining, strife, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, fear, anxiety, worry, etc. And so even though he had rescued them out of Egypt, he still had to get Egypt out of the inside of them. And in the same way, after we receive salvation and are born again, we have to go through the process of sanctification to get Egypt out of the inside of us, where we have to repent for the mindsets of Egypt and the kingdom of darkness like anger, hurt, offense, bitterness, unforgiveness, fear, anxiety, worry, stress, guilt, shame, a low self-esteem, the lie of rejection, unworthiness, fleshliness, lukewarmness, wilderness, compromise, etc., and get rid of all that stuff from the kingdom of darkness that is putting black ink spots on our wedding garments through washing our spiritual wedding garments with soap, which is the blood of Yeshua that we apply to our lives through repentance. Because remember, 1 John 1 verse 9 says that when we repent, the blood of Yeshua cleanses us of all unrighteousness. And after applying the soap, which is his blood, we then need to do the washing of the water of the word, where we renew our minds with the word of God and retrain ourselves to think like God thinks in each of these areas, which is how we cleanse our wedding garments so that they are pure white without those black ink spots that have now been washed out through this lifestyle of repentance and sanctification. And therefore we are ready dressed in clean, pure white wedding garments and are ready for his second coming when he comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And just like the Israelites had 40 years in the desert to do this process of repentance and sanctification, so we were given 40 jubilees to do this preparation process before his second coming because 40 multiplied by 50 years equals 2,000 years in total. Just like Yeshua fasted in the desert for 40 days and was tested through the temptations of the devil, you see this number 40 come up all the time on the biblical prophetic timeline because the number 40 represents a time of testing, a time where God's people are given the chance to go through this vitally important process of repentance and sanctification after salvation. And then just as Moses died at the age of 120 years old, exactly to the day, because he died on the same day as his birthday, so Moses died at exactly 120 years old, to later be resurrected to be in the presence of the king, so Yeshua is coming on the 120th Jubilee at the time of what scripture calls the first resurrection, which I'll explain in detail from scripture in a later episode. But it's where all of his people, including those Christians who were left behind at the rapture, but who then repented in the time of the great tribulation and did not take the mark and were martyred for standing by their faith in Yeshua the Messiah, 
at the end of the 6,000 years, the 120th Jubilee, at Yeshua's second coming, all his people are raised up to live with him in his presence forever, which is the time, as I mentioned, of the first resurrection. And again, I'll give all the detail in the scriptures for all of that in future episodes, which will just add layer upon layer upon layer of evidence that backs up and solidifies the timeline that I'm beginning to open up to you here. When you see everything all fit together, like the pieces of a puzzle, as it all connects with Yahweh's prophetic patterns in scripture, then you know that you are on the right track. So coming back to how all this relates to the main subject of this video, remember in Daniel chapter 9, there were two prophecies. The prophecy about the 70 years, and then the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel which were both mentioned together here because they are connected. The first prophecy was about the 70 years that the people of Israel would be in bondage and captivity in Babylon after the city of Jerusalem and the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonian invasion. And we learned the significance of why it was specifically a 70 year period. Because of the 490 years between the time of King Saul and the Babylonian invasion, where the people of Israel did not walk in obedience to the instructions of Yahweh's word, including not honoring the Jubilee year. So each year of the 70 years they were in captivity in Babylon corresponded with each of the 70 Jubilees that they did not honor during that 490 year period. Then in the second prophecy in Daniel chapter nine, which is the 70 weeks of Daniel, in this timeline, you see that same pattern where you see the number 490 years again. Because 69 weeks, as I explained earlier, is equivalent to 483 years when using the prophetic code of one day equals one year. And the final 70th week represents seven years because again, using the one day equals one year prophetic code in a week is seven days, which prophetically corresponds with seven years. So 483 years plus seven years is that same number 490 again. Then as we saw in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel and the prophecy of Jonah, because of what the Jewish people of Israel did to Yeshua, where they murdered and crucified him, they were given 40 years to repent before God's judgment fell and the second temple and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed again and the people were scattered through all the nations in bondage and captivity. Again, see the connection between that 40 years that they were given to repent and the 40 years of the Israelites in the desert and the 40 Jubilees, which is the 2000 years, which is given to us to repent so that we don't have to be a part of God's judgment that falls in the great tribulation. Now, what is the significance of 490 that we see in both the 70 years prophecy and also in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel? Well, let's have a look at that because it's going to take us to a very interesting prophecy by Ezekiel, where 2,600 years in advance, Yahweh foretold the exact year that the nation of Israel would be reborn in 1948 and the city of Jerusalem would be restored to the people of Israel in 1967. You see, when we walk in disobedience to the instructions of Yahweh's word and he allows a destruction from the enemy to come as a wake up call to repent and return to him, but we still refuse to repent. He says in Leviticus chapter 26 that he will multiply that punishment by sevenfold. 
And if you still don't listen, he will multiply that by seven times again. And seven multiplied by seven is 49, which again is related to the 70 Jubilee cycles Israel ignored and did not honor, which is where you see the 490 years come from in both the 70 years prophecy and the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. Now, before you switch off because you think, oh, well, Leviticus 26 is Old Testament, let me tell you, we are, are about to experience these same patterns of seven in all the events described in the book of Revelation, like the seven plagues represented by the first white horse or the first seal, seven key biblical end time wars represented by the second red horse of war, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, etc. It goes on and on because his prophetic patterns are consistently the same throughout the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, because as Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, he is the same yesterday, today and forever, and his instructions in righteousness never change. So let's take some time to read it from a few selected verses from Leviticus chapter 26, which shows us how when his people refuse to repent, he increases the severity of his judgments by multiplications of seven. And if you go take the time to read the whole chapter of Leviticus 26 on your own and compare it to the judgments that come in the first four horses and seven seals of the book of Revelation, you will see that they are exactly the same. So let's read the scripture. And if in spite of this, you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant. And if you gather within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. And I will lay your cities waste and will make your sanctuaries, which is their temple, desolate. And I will not smell your pleasing aromas. And I myself will devastate the land so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and I will unsheath the sword after you and your land shall be a desolation and your cities shall be a waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate. While you are in your enemy's land, then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest. The rest that it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. And by the way, this passage of scripture here are the verses that show us the significance of why it was specifically a 70 year period that the people had to spend in captivity in Babylon. Because as I've shared several times now, each year in captivity corresponded with the 70 jubilees that they did not honor and rest the land over the 490 year period between King Saul and the Babylonian captivity. But continuing with reading the scripture, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies, and you shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. So four times in this chapter, Yahweh repeats the fact that he will increase the people of Israel's punishment by sevenfold, emphasizing the point that he is not playing games here. He really means what he says. 
Either we walk in repentance as we return to a love relationship with him, and as an overflow of that love relationship, walk in obedience to Abba Father's kingdom ways and his cycles of seven, where we enjoy his blessing in every area of life, including the wonderful blessing of all that the year of Jubilee represents, both physically, spiritually, and prophetically, or if we refuse to repent and continue in disobedience, we experience the enemy coming in to steal, kill, and destroy in every area of life in those cycles of seven instead. And interestingly, Yahweh continued in the cycle of multiplication by seven years of punishment with his people right up until present day. Because sadly, right from the first punishment, when his judgment fell on his people, when they went into captivity in Babylon for 70 years, they never really fully repented. Many didn't even return to the promised land, and most didn't obey Yahweh's commandments. Even after the rebuilding of the second temple, Israel remained in rebellion and refused to repent and return to him. Israel's continued disobedience resulted in greater punishment coming into effect each time. Since the time of the Roman invasion in 70 AD, when the second temple was destroyed, the people of Israel were scattered throughout all the nations, where they were repeatedly persecuted and taken into captivity and trampled upon for centuries. Until finally, in 1948, as scripture foretold would happen, in a day, the nation of Israel was birthed again. Isaiah 66 verse 8. Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jerusalem's birth pangs begin, her children will be born. And now this brings us to a significant prophecy by Ezekiel, which builds on this timeline from the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel I've shown you here in this video, where Ezekiel foretold the exact year that the nation of Israel would be restored in 1948 and the exact year that the city of Jerusalem would be restored to the people of Israel in 1967. And in that prophecy, you are going to see this exact same pattern of sevens showing up again. Ezekiel 4 verse 1 to 8 says, And you, son of man, take a brick and lay it before you, and engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem, and put siege works against it, and build a siege wall against it, and cast up a mound against it, set camps also against it, and plant battering rams against it all around. And you take an iron grid, and place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and set your face towards it, and let it be in a state of siege, and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. For I assign you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of the years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. And when you have completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. Forty days I assign you, a day for each year. And you shall set your face towards the siege of Jerusalem, with your arm bared, and you shall prophesy against the city. And behold, I will place cords upon you, so that you cannot turn from one side to the other till you have completed the days of your siege. 
So in the scripture, Yahweh gets Ezekiel to do a prophetic act, symbolizing what will literally happen to Israel in the future. Because of their disobedience to his kingdom ways and their refusal to repent and return to him. And the siege being described here starts with the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar at the Babylonian invasion, during which the first group of Israelites, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, went into captivity. But this prophetic act that Yahweh asked Ezekiel to do was one unbelievable task. Ezekiel literally physically laid on his side for 430 days in a row. And Yahweh even strapped him down so that he couldn't turn. 430 days to lie on your side is a long time. That is just over one year and two months of lying down in the same position without moving. Now that's a picture worth more than a thousand words. It's only by the hand of Yahweh that he didn't get pressure sores that would have chewed his flesh to the bone of his skeleton on the side he was lying. This incredible physical feat performed by Ezekiel as a prophetic act of what was to come was no doubt designed to catch the attention of the Israelite people as they would have eventually been astonished to witness how long he was literally lying on his one side for. So the years of punishment and exile and captivity assigned by Yahweh was 390 years for the house of Israel plus 40 years for the house of Judah, which is a total of 430 years. Now let's just first have a quick look at the significance of why it was specifically a period of 430 years of punishment that Yahweh assigned to the people. This takes us back to Exodus 12 verse 40. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years to the very day all Yahweh's divisions left Egypt. Ezekiel was given his prophecy 800 years later after the exodus from Egypt with Moses and the Israelites took place. And so the story of the time that the Israelites were in Egypt, in bondage, slavery and captivity there, and then their deliverance and exodus out of Egypt, was very familiar to the people at the time when Ezekiel was given this prophecy. So Yahweh specifically used the number 430 to send a message to the people of Israel through that specific number because that specific number 430 would immediately ring a bell in their minds as they would be reminded that 430 years was the time that the Israelites spent in captivity, bondage and slavery in Egypt. And therefore they would have known what the number 430 represented in terms of its connection to Egypt and representing a time of punishment in captivity. And so they would have immediately known what that number means. And so that specific number of 430 was a clear message to the people of Israel that if they did not heed Yahweh's repeated warnings and calls to them to repent and return to him, they would end up in the same position again of being exiled and scattered from Israel and in slavery, bondage and captivity to other Gentile nations where they would be repeatedly oppressed, persecuted and experience attempted genocide. And so the number 430 specifically represents a time of punishment and captivity in biblical prophecy before God's people are finally delivered by him and restored to their inheritance. Now let me show you how Ezekiel's prophecy foretold the birthing of the nation of Israel in 1948 with phenomenal mathematical precision.
We already know from Leviticus 26, verse 34 to 35, that the first 70 years was for them not honoring the Jubilee Sabbath rest for the people and the land. For those 490 years between the time of King Saul and the Babylonian invasion. Because Israel had refused to give the land its Sabbath rest every seventh year, Yahweh took it into his own hands and rested the land for the time that it was owed, whilst the people were in captivity, making it impossible for them to continue working the land. But there are still 360 years remaining, because 430 years minus the 70 years of punishment they did in Babylon equals 360 years of punishment still remaining. Now to crack this prophetic code in Ezekiel, you first need to understand that in biblical prophecy, a year is 360 days. When we study how long the Great Tribulation will be in episode 3, we will see some scriptures from Genesis, the book of Daniel, and the book of Revelation that definitively describes a year as 360 days. Now in science, a year is defined as the time it takes for the earth to do a full 360 degree turn on its axis, which at the moment is 365 and a quarter days. In Genesis, when Yahweh created the earth, it took 360 days for the earth to do one complete turn on its axis defining one year. But during the events that took place in Noah's flood, the earth was knocked off its original axis, which then resulted in a 365 day year as we have at the moment. But at the time of the sixth seal in Revelation, at the start of the Great Tribulation, which we will learn about in episode three, an asteroid hits the Earth, which knocks the Earth back into its original rotational axis, where a year becomes 360 days again, thus fulfilling the timeline prophecies about the end times described in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. So when we deal with timelines in biblical prophecy, a year is 360 days. So in the prophecy of Ezekiel, after the initial 70 years in Babylon, after the destruction of the first temple, there was still to be 360 years of exile from Israel as punishment after the destruction of the second temple with the Roman invasion. And remember, according to Leviticus 26, this is multiplied sevenfold. So 360 times seven, equals 2,520 years of punishment and exile from Israel remaining. To understand how this falls in the Gregorian calendar that the world uses, which is the calendar that we are most used to, we now have to convert those years into days. So 2,520 years times 360 days for each biblical year equals a total of 907,200 days. To find out how many years 907,200 days is in the world's Gregorian calendar, we now need to divide that by a year in the Gregorian calendar, which is 365.25 days. So 907,200 days divided by 365.25 days equals 2,483.778 years, which is equivalent to 2,483 years, 9 months, and 10 days. Now when does this timeline start? Well, we already know from the beginning of the story at the beginning of this video that the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar began in 605 BC and lasted 70 years to the day using the prophetic 360 day year, ending in 536 BC in the biblical month of Nisan, which is in the March-April period. 
when the first group of Israelites returned to Israel after the decree of King Cyrus setting them free from captivity. So 536 BC is when the timeline begins. And if you do the calculations as shown on the screen, where you count 2,483 years, 9 months and 10 days from 536 BC, taking into account that you don't count the year zero when you cross over from BC to AD, which is why you have to say plus one. The year that it lands you on is 1948. And as everybody knows from how history unfolded after the Second World War, the nation of Israel was restored on May 14, 1948. So here again, we see how scripture prophesied about what would take place with pinpoint accuracy. And then remember earlier in the video, I mentioned that there was also another 70 year period between the destruction of the first temple in 586 BC and when the rebuilding of the second temple was finished in 516 BC. And when you use the time that the rebuilding of the second temple was finished as the starting point, and you add 2,483 years, nine months, 10 days from there, using the calculation shown on the screen, again taking into account that you don't count the year zero when crossing over from BC to AD, which is again why you have to say plus one, the year that you land on is 1967. And of course, as all of us know from history, after a phenomenal six-day war in which Yahweh worked many miracles for the army of Israel, Jerusalem was restored to the people of Israel on the 7th of June, 1967. So history unfolded precisely according to the exact year as Yahweh prophesied it would 2,600 years earlier through the prophet Ezekiel. Wow! And you are going to see, as we continue to go through this video series, that the prophecies of the book of Revelation are now beginning to unfold before our very eyes with the exact same pinpoint accuracy. Throughout Leviticus 26, Yahweh describes his punishments in cycles of multiplications of seven, as over and over again, his people refuse to repent and return to him. But he ends with saying in Leviticus 26, verse 42 to 45, Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them, and they shall make amends for their iniquity because their soul abhorred my statutes. So here again we see in scripture the reason for the initial 70 years of captivity in Babylon, where each year corresponded with the 70 Sabbath Jubilee rests that they did not honor. Although it wasn't just about the Jubilee year that they didn't honor, they weren't following Yahweh's commandments and instructions and righteousness in his word in general, especially the most important ones, like having that intimate love relationship with him, where you love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and with all your strength. Their hearts were far from him. They were not walking in a close love relationship with him, which is the most important key thing. Because as Yeshua said in John 14 verse 15, if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. You see, when you really genuinely deeply love somebody, it's just a natural response that you want to please them. And so a natural overflow 
of a deep, genuine, sincere love relationship with Abba Father is to walk in obedience to his commandments, the instructions of righteousness in his word. But in spite of them not doing all of that, look how wonderful our Abba Father is as we continue to read how he finishes off Leviticus 26, where he described his punishments and judgments increasing in mul multiplications of seven because his people still stayed stubborn and refused to return to him and repent. Yet for all of that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spur spurn them, neither will I abhor them, so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them, for I am Yahweh their God, Elohim. But I will for their sake remember the covenant with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I may be their God, Elohim. I am Yahweh. And here he finishes with that same resounding, powerful statement, I am Yahweh. Yahweh means the great I am. And one of the wonderful things about the great I am is that he is a God of redemption and reconciliation, which is a pattern of his character and nature that you also see throughout scripture. For example, the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost is a celebration of receiving the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. First, on the exact date of Shavuot, Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, where he received the Ten Commandments, the Ketubah marriage covenant between Yeshua and his people. And you know the story when Moses came down the mountain, he found the people in spiritual adultery worshipping the golden calf, and so he smashed the stone tablets, representing a tearing up of the marriage covenant. And that day, 3,000 people died because of their disobedience and rebellion. And every detail in this story is significant, including that number 3,000. Because several centuries later, in Acts chapter 2, 50 days after Yeshua was crucified for our sins, the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples in tongues of fire on the exact same day of the biblical feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. And being filled with the Holy Spirit, the disciples were filled with boldness and they went out and preached the gospel. And that day, 3000 people got saved and born again. That was a redemption and restoration of the 3,000 people who were killed on the same day at the time of Moses. Because that is who Yahweh, the great I am, is, a God of redemption and restoration. As we see in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 to 19, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Yeshua the Messiah, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Yeshua, the Messiah, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Just as the 3,000 people who were saved and born again on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost was a redemption and restoration of the 3,000 people who died and who were lost on the same day at the time of Moses. In the same way, in the beginning, the people of Israel were robbed of 70 years of being in their land whilst they were in captivity to Babylon. And after the cycles of seven of punishment were over, as explained in Leviticus 26 and the prophecy of Ezekiel we just studied, Abba Father restored his people to their land in 1948 and he gave them back 70 years to enjoy being in their land.
The restoration of Israel in 1948 was a major end time sign on the prophetic timeline because that marked the beginning of what is nicknamed the fig tree generation. Because in the context of describing all the events that would take place in the end times in the book of Revelation, Yeshua said about the timing of his return in Matthew 24 verse 32 to 33, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. The first layer of the meaning of this, where it speaks about the fig tree beginning to blossom by as its branches that become tender, refers to the rebirthing of the nation of Israel, which happened in 1948. And then the people of Israel enjoyed 70 years in their land, which is considered as a generation. So that 70 years was from 1948 to 2018. And then what happened in 2019? The end began. The first event of the book of Revelation unfolded. The first birth pang, the first plague of the seven plagues that the first white horse of Revelation represents. Coming back to Isaiah 66 verse 8, which prophesied about Israel being reborn in 1948 in one day. Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, her children will be born. So first the scripture speaks about Israel being born again in 1948. Then the last sentence says that by the time her children are born, which means by the time the next generation of 70 years begins, the birth pains or the birth pangs, which is a prophetic reference to the end time events in the book of Revelation, will begin. And sure enough, from the time Israel was restored in 1948, they enjoyed one generation of 70 years in the land until 2018. And then, in the beginning of the next generation, the end time events of the book of Revelation began to unfold in 2019. Now so far, all the pieces of the puzzle we have looked at up until now has opened up the timing of when the events of the book of Revelation began to unfold. But what if it also opens up to us the timing of when all the events of the book of Revelation come to an end. Let me explain. First, let's read Matthew 24, verses 32 to 33 again, but now also including verse 34. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all of these things have happened. So Yeshua said that this generation will not pass away until all of these things have already happened. But what things? Well, in Matthew chapter 24, Yeshua basically summarized all the events that take place in the book of Revelation. And the exact same account is also given in Luke 21 and Mark 13. For example, he mentioned worldwide plagues, which is the first white horse of Revelation, which is also the first seal. 
he mentioned the red horse of war, which is the second seal of Revelation. He mentioned the global famine of the third black horse of Revelation, which is the third seal. He mentioned nation rising against nation and kingdom rising against kingdom, which is the unprecedented persecution of Christians and the Jewish people of Israel in the fourth seal and the martyring of some of God's people in the fifth seal. And he mentioned an unprecedented global mega earthquake, which we will learn in episode three, happens in the sixth seal as a result of an asteroid in impact. And in Matthew 24, Yeshua brilliantly summarized all the events of the book of Revelation, including the rapture, the great tribulation, and his second coming on his white horse at the battle of Armageddon to defeat the Antichrist. And so in Matthew 24, when Yeshua speaks of the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem being restored to the people of Israel, in a parable likened to the blossoming of a fig tree, he is saying that the generation in which this takes place will not pass away until all the events in the book of Revelation has happened and already taken place. In other words, that is the end of the book of Revelation. So let's have a look at the possibility of this on the timeline. Now I'm using the word possibility here on purpose because I am very hesitant and reluctant to set specific dates. In Matthew 23 verse 33, Yeshua said, just like when you see the fig tree blossom, you know that summer is near. Summer is a season. And in the same way, it gives us a clue to the season of the timing of his return. So far, in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, we have established the timing of all that Yeshua accomplished in his first coming when he died on the cross in 30 AD. And I've hinted to you several times that scripture solidly establishes that it will be 2000 years between Yeshua's first coming when he was crucified and all the events taking place surrounding his second coming which is the rapture, great tribulation, and his second coming in the battle of Armageddon being over and having already happened 2000 years later from 30 AD, which brings us to the season somewhere approximately around 2030 AD. And again, I am purposefully using the word season, somewhere, and approximately because I am very reluctant to set a definite date and say, this is definitely it. Because right now, we don't definitely know. But what if? What if the Feast of Tabernacles in 2030 AD could possibly be the year that all the events of the book of Revelation have already happened, like Matthew 24 verse 34 says? marking the start of the final 1000 years millennium rest, where Yeshua physically takes his people back to the land of Israel and he sets up his throne in Jerusalem from where he rules and reigns with his bride for 1000 years. What if? The reason I am throwing this out there as at least a highly likely plausible possibility to consider is because let's go back to the prophetic patterns we have been looking at. Remember, we started with two initial timelines. The first timeline was the 70 years that the people of Israel were in bondage and captivity in Babylon, which marked the starting point in the timeline of the Ezekiel prophecy that took us to 1948 when the land of Israel was restored to the people. And then a generation, which is 70 years from there, took us to 2019, when the events of the book of Revelation began. Now let's have a look at the second timeline, 
which was the 70 year period between the destruction of the first temple and restoration of the second temple, which marked the starting point in the timeline of the Ezekiel prophecy that took us to 1967 when the city of Jerusalem was restored to the people of Israel. Now, what if there is a connection here in the timeline between this event and Yeshua taking his people back to the promised land of Israel and setting up his throne in Jerusalem to rule and reign with his bride for a thousand years in the final millennium, meaning the rapture, great tribulation, and his second coming at the Battle of Armageddon have already happened and taken place, as Yeshua said in Matthew 24, verse 34. It's a reasonable question to ask, because the first timeline showed us the beginning of the events of the book of Revelation. And so it could be a highly likely possibility that the second timeline shows us the end of the events of the book of Revelation. Because according to Matthew 24 verse 34, from 1967, that generation will not pass away before all the events in the book of Revelation have taken place and already happened. And a generation is 70 years. 70 years from 1967 is 2037. So in other words, the world will not reach 2037 in the Gregorian calendar for a generation of 70 years to be completed before all the events in the book of Revelation have taken place and have been fulfilled and have already happened. Now coming back to 2030, where I am saying, what if this could possibly be the year that marks the start of the final millennium? Between 1967, when the city of Jerusalem was restored to the people of Israel, and 2030, it is 63 years. Now, is there any significance or any prophetic pattern that we have seen before concerning 63 years? Yes, in the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. From the time that Jerusalem was rebuilt and restored to the people of Israel, it was 62 weeks plus one week, which is a total of 63 prophetic weeks until all the events surrounding Yeshua's first coming were completed and had happened and been fulfilled. In the same way or in the same pattern, could there possibly also be 63 years between the time that the city of Jerusalem was restored to the people of Israel in 1967 and all the events surrounding Yeshua's second coming having been completed and having happened in 2030 AD, when Yeshua also physically takes his people back to the land of Israel and restores the city of Jerusalem to them when he sets up his throne in Jerusalem from where he rules and reigns with his bride for a thousand years. Given that all the other pieces of the puzzle in these prophetic patterns have fit together precisely to the T, it is most certainly a plausible possibility to consider this final piece of the puzzle that completes the story. But we don't know for sure. Time will tell. I'm not stating it as a fact, just an idea that I'm putting out there that is plausible enough to at least mention, especially with a multitude of layer upon layer of evidence from scripture and history that I still have to present in this video and in several episodes to come. I will focus a lot more on the subject of the fig tree prophecy and how it is interconnected with other prophecies of Ezekiel in depth as well in a future episode. And my goodness, there is just so much to share. The word of God truly is a treasure chest filled with golden nuggets of profound revelation that just blows your mind. I don't know about you, but this just makes me come alive. 
when I see how the Word of God interconnects with all these incredible patterns in such depth and detail. And I hope this is making it obvious to you that the Word of God is no ordinary book with words made up by man, because man is just not smart enough to come up with something like this. There is no way that the Bible, which was written by 40 different authors over thousands of years, could so precisely interconnect in all these patterns and foretell with such accurate precision what would unfold in history. It can only be God-breathed and God-inspired. And I hope that this is making you hungry for more and more of his word and to feast on it more and more as we continue to dig deeper and deeper into his word together in this video series. Lisa is now going to share a beautiful ministry song that is relevant to all that I've just shared. Then I encourage you to take a break because you have just digested a lot and you want your mind refreshed for the last section of this video coming up because I've saved the best for last. And in this last section, I'm going to share incredible things from scripture and history with you that is once again breathtakingly wow and ends the message of this video with a powerful bang.
As I mentioned earlier, the timeline in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel was a key foundation to establish because knowing the year that Yeshua was crucified, buried and resurrected then enables us to know the timing or the season of all the events that will take place surrounding his second coming. So far, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel has pointed to 30 AD. And the prophecy of Jonah, which indicated that unless the people repented, in 40 years, the temple and city of Jerusalem would be destroyed and the people scattered in captivity to all nations across the earth, which is a fixed historical fact that it definitely happened in 70 AD. And so 40 years before 70 AD takes you to 30 AD. So, so far, we have two prophecies in scripture backed up by how history unfolded that points to 30 AD being the year that Yeshua was crucified. But now to really solidify this date of 30 AD as being accurate beyond any reasonable doubt, I need to tell you a little bit more about the biblical feast called the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur in Hebrew, and what its three prophetic fulfillments represent because this is going to reveal some facts about our Messiah and what happened at the time he was crucified that is going to blow your mind. This revelation I am about to share not only solidly proves the year that he died, but it also gives very solid, undeniable proof that Yeshua is who the Bible says that he is, the Messiah and the Son of God. For those that are still familiarizing themselves with the biblical feasts, here is a quick two minute summary to remind you where the Day of Atonement fits in in the bigger picture in the seven biblical feasts that tell the story of Yahweh's plan for mankind. Passover prophetically represents when Yeshua was crucified and he did die on the cross on the day of Passover at the exact time that they used to sacrifice the Passover lamb because he is the spotless lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. So when Yeshua was crucified, he fulfilled the prophetic meaning of the feast of Passover. The feast of unleavened bread represents when Yeshua was buried in the tomb, which he literally was in the tomb during the dates of this feast thereby fulfilling the prophetic meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of First Fruits represents when Yeshua rose from the dead, which he literally did on the exact date of the Feast of First Fruits, becoming the first fruits of many to come, which is you and me and all those who are born again through the salvation that he provided for us on the cross, as explained, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 23. Then 50 days after Passover is the biblical feast of Pentecost, which is called Shavuot in Hebrew, the prophetic meaning of which was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 on this exact day when the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of fire on the disciples in the upper room. So what all those first four feasts prophetically represent has been fulfilled and has already taken place at the time of Yeshua's first coming. The three feasts at the end of the year, which are just about to be fulfilled in the very near future, is the fifth biblical feast, which is the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah in Hebrew, which represents the rapture when Yeshua comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The second biblical feast is the Day of Atonement, which is called Yom Kippur in Hebrew, which is what we need to focus on now. And it is prophetically symbolic of the Great Tribulation. And here is an example of how the patterns of seven all interconnect. 
because the sixth biblical feast of Yom Kippur, representing the Great Tribulation, begins with God's judgment hitting the earth at the sixth seal and ends at the sixth trumpet. When Yeshua returns on his white horse, as described in Revelation chapter 19, with heaven's armies, which is his worshipping warrior bride, riding with him, where he defeats the false prophet, the Antichrist, and the Antichrist's armies that are gathered to fight against him. The seventh biblical feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents when Yeshua will set up his throne in Jerusalem, from where he will rule and reign with his bride on earth for a thousand years. This is a time when he will tabernacle with us, which means that he will literally physically dwell amongst us and live with us here on earth during the final 1,000 year millennium rest. Just as Yeshua fulfilled the first four feasts in order exactly to the day in his first coming, so he is going to fulfill what the last three feasts prophetically represent in order exactly to the day in his second coming. And as we study the book of Revelation, we are going to see a lot of detail there that describes what took place in the Old Testament during these feasts as prophetic actions of what will literally physically take place and be fulfilled in the end times in the book of Revelation during these last three biblical feasts. But what we need to focus on now is the Day of Atonement where we are now going to look at the three different aspects or the three different prophetic fulfillments of the Day of Atonement. The word atonement is all about purification and cleansing of sin through paying the price, which scripture calls the wages for that sin. Remember that in the context of prophesying about when the Messiah would come, and how he would die to pay the price for our sins. Daniel 9 verse 24 said, 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to stop their transgression, to put an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. The first aspect or prophetic fulfillment of the Day of Atonement is redemption that was provided for us through the salvation that Yeshua gave us on the cross. The blood Yeshua poured out when he was crucified provided atonement for our sins, where he was the ultimate sacrifice, paying the price for our sin for us. In this regard, something amazingly significant was done on the Day of Atonement that represents the atonement Yeshua provided for us on the cross. And bear with me, because later you are going to see how this is one of the major historical facts that proves the year that Yeshua was crucified. What Yahweh instructed the people to do on the Day of Atonement is described in Leviticus 16 verses 2 to 22. Yahweh said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother that he must not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil, the holy of holies, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Aaron as high priest shall enter the holy place in this way, with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and the blood of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall take from the congregation of the Israelites at their expense two male goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall present the bull as the sin offering for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And by the way, the tent of meeting is the tabernacle. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh, the other lot for the scapegoat. 
Then Aaron shall bring the goat on which Yahweh's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement on it. It shall be sent into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Now remember that name, scapegoat. We'll soon learn the significance of that. Another scriptural name for this goat is the Azazel goat. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the sins of the people and bring its blood within the veil into the most holy place and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place, holy of holies, because of the uncleanness and transgressions of the Israelites for all their sins. He shall also do this for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness and impurities. There shall be no person in the tent of meeting when the high priest goes in to make atonement in the holy place within the veil until he comes out so that he may make atonement for himself, his own sins, and for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar of burnt offering in the court, which is before Yahweh, and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the goat, and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on the altar of burnt offering seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. See the same pattern of sevens we've been looking at in this video appearing again here. Remember in Leviticus chapter 26 and in the time the people of Israel spent in captivity in Babylon and in the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy, and in the Ezekiel prophecy, we saw Abba Father continuing to strike the people sevenfold for their sins, multiplying their punishment by seven, each time they refused to repent. And here, on the Day of Atonement, we see the high priest sprinkling the blood on the altar seven times, which was a prophetic act of what Yeshua, the ultimate high priest, would physically do when he atoned for the sins of his people with his own blood on the cross. But continuing reading from Leviticus chapter 16. When he has finished atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle and the altar, he shall present the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat, the scapegoat, the sin bearer, and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is prepared for the task. The goat shall carry on itself all of the Israelites' wickedness carrying them to a solitary infertile land, and he shall release the goats in the wilderness. So as you can see in this passage of scripture, in Leviticus chapter 16, two goats were selected, which by the way had to be spotless without any blemish or defect. And we are now going to learn how both of these goats were symbolic of Yeshua, the spotless sinless Lamb of God, and as I mentioned earlier, this is going to lead to some astonishing events related to these two goats that took place in 30 AD, proving that Yeshua was crucified in that year. One of the goats was killed and sacrificed as a sin offering, whose blood then provided atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. The high priest had to take the blood of the goat that was sacrificed as a sin offering behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies to sprinkle it on the atonement cover on the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant to make atonement for the sins that the people had committed that year. That was a foreshadow or prophetic act of what Yeshua would do for us on the cross 
when he shed his blood to make atonement for our sins once and for all. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then 1 John 1 verse 7 says, And the blood of Yeshua his Son cleanses us from all sin. The earthly tabernacle that Yahweh directed Moses to make in Exodus chapter 25 is a foreshadow of the real tabernacle that literally exists in heaven. How do we know that? Well, we're going to see this in lots of verses in scripture in this video and in future episodes to come as we go through this book of Revelation video series. But just like the high priest would take the blood of the goat sacrificed as a sin offering into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, that is also what Yeshua did as our high priest after he defeated death in the grave by rising from the dead and ascended to heaven and he went into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle in heaven and sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat there to make atonement for our sins by his blood once for all. This is fully explained in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. For example, Hebrews 9 verse 12 says, With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. When Yeshua died, the veil separating the Holy of Holies from the people was torn in two from top to bottom, showing that access has been made available to all of us to be able to go into Abba Father's presence and have a personal, intimate love relationship with him. Hebrews 4 verse 14 to 16 says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Yeshua the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Therefore let us with privilege, fearlessly and confidently and boldly approach his throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help in time of need, appropriate help and well-timed help, coming just when we need it. Think about what a tremendous blessing and privilege this is. If you were to book an appointment with a king on this earth today, it would be a tremendous process and ordeal to even be able to get an appointment. And if you are lucky enough to even get one, it would probably be a once of appointment for a very limited amount of time. But because of what Yeshua did for us on the cross, the veil has been torn in two and we can come before the throne of the King of Kings, the magnificent almighty God who is the great I am and meet with him as our father and share our hearts with him any time that we like. So part of the biblical feast of Yom Kippur is that it's a time to be grateful for the great price Yeshua paid by making a way for our sins to be atoned for and forgiven when we repent. So there were two goats that were selected on the Day of Atonement. The one goat was sacrificed as a sin offering, and we now understand how this was a prophetic foreshadow of what Yeshua would do for us on the cross. Then as we read in Leviticus 16 verses 21 to 22, the second goat became the scapegoat or Azazel. The priest was to lay both hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the sin, transgression, iniquities and wickedness of the people. And in this way, the priest ceremonially placed the nation's sin upon the Azazel's scapegoat. 
The scapegoat was then sent out into the desert, symbolic of all the sins of the people being carried away. And some historical writings say that the goat was pushed over a cliff as a prophetic act of the sin of the people that this goat was carrying being removed by the goat's death. Because as Romans 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. In other words, the price to pay for sin is death. Can you see how this was a foreshadow that was prophetically symbolic of what Yeshua would do for us on the cross? When he took all our sins upon himself and literally carried our sins and iniquities as he paid the price for our sin for us with his death? Isaiah prophesied of how Yeshua would fulfill this. Isaiah 53 verse 4 Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Isaiah 53 verse 11 As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Matthew 8 verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. 1 Peter 2 verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. In both Jewish and Christian historical writings, three examples of which are shown on the screen, they also record how a scarlet red cloth made of wool was tied around the neck of the scapegoat or Azazel, where the scarlet red color symbolically represented the sin of the people. And then a piece of this red wool cloth was also taken from the Azazel scapegoat and tied to the door of the temple. And a miracle took place every year for 1,500 years, where that red scarlet cord around the scapegoat's neck would turn white. As a sign that Yahweh had approved of the sacrificial sin offering and blood poured out as an atonement for the people's sin that year. And so that day of atonement had been acceptable to Yahweh and the people of Israel were reassured that they had been forgiven of their sins for another year. This again was a foreshadow of how the blood of Yeshua poured out for us on the cross would cleanse and wash us of our sin until we are as white as snow. Yahweh explained the meaning of this in Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come, now let's settle this, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. So on the day of Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement, two goats were selected. One was sacrificed as a sin offering, where its blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies to atone for the people's sins. And then the other goat became the scapegoat that was released into the wilderness, symbolically carrying the people's sins away. We read in Leviticus 16 verse 8 to 9 that when the two goats were selected on the Day of Atonement, which goat would be the sin offering and which goat would be the scapegoat was determined by throwing lots. Interestingly, as it relates to these two goats and how they were connected to Yeshua, it's no coincidence that the soldiers cast lots at the foot of the cross when Yeshua the spotless, sinless Lamb of God was crucified to pay the price for our sin. Now this story of the two goats, what they represent, and how they are related to the atonement from sin 
that Yeshua provided for us when he shed his blood on the cross is going to become very significant to the timeline of the book of Revelation in a moment. The first aspect of the Day of Atonement was prophetically fulfilled when Yeshua died on the cross and provided salvation for anybody who is willing to accept him as their Savior. And as Romans 10 verse 9 says, if you openly declare that Yeshua is the Messiah and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So redemption and salvation is the first aspect of the Day of Atonement. And even for those of us born again Christians, his desire is that we apply his blood to our lives now through a lifestyle of repentance so that we can be ready and prepared as his bride for his second coming. This is the aspect of the Day of Atonement he preferably wants all of us to be a part of. Because otherwise, we will be left behind to go through the second aspect that the Day of Atonement prophetically represents, which is the Great Tribulation, where the power of Yahweh is demonstrated in a mighty and terrifying way as his judgment falls with a great outpouring of his anger and wrath for the evil and wickedness of the people. This is where the Day of Atonement is referred to in Scripture as the Day of Vengeance and the Year of Retribution. This time of great tribulation and judgment is why the Day of Atonement is referred to in Scripture as the great and terrible day of Yahweh. And as I mentioned, this is where there is a demonstration of God's power. For example, in Amos 4 verses 6 to 12, Yahweh called his people over and over again to return to him in repentance. But they stayed in sin and rebellion, and they rejected his call and multiple warnings, and continued in their fleshly, lukewarm, worldly lifestyle of compromise. And so eventually Yahweh said, Prepare to meet your God in judgment, O Israel. And we see exactly the same pattern take place in the end times. This second prophetic aspect of the Day of Atonement, representing the Great Tribulation, begins at the time of the sixth seal, which is when God's judgment will hit the earth. We know this because of another few verses in Leviticus 26, verses 11 to 14, which describes Yahweh's instructions to Aaron the high priest on the Day of Atonement in terms of what he must do as a prophetic act representing what will literally physically take place at the time of the sixth seal, described in Revelation 6, verses 12 to 17, and Revelation 8, verses 3 to 5. Let's have a brief look. Aaron shall present the bull as the sin offering for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household, the other priests. And he shall kill the bull as the sin offering for himself. He shall take a censer full of burning coals from the bronze altar before Yahweh. And by the way, the bronze altar here is talking about the incense altar in the tabernacle. And two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil into the most holy place. Now what I want you to especially remember from these verses we've just read is the description of the high priest taking a censer of burning coals from the incense altar, which in the tabernacle represents the prayers of the saints. Remember that and make it stick in your mind, because we are going to see the same description in the book of Revelation in a moment. But continuing reading the next two verses of Leviticus 26. And put the incense on the fire in the censer before Yahweh, so that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the Ark of the Covenant, otherwise he will die. 
He shall take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the east side of the mercy seat. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Okay, with that scripture about the Day of Atonement we have just read in the back of our minds, now let's have a look at Revelations 8 verses 3 to 5, where we will see an angel in the heavenly tabernacle, which I'm sure is actually our high priest Yeshua, doing exactly what the high priest would do in Leviticus 16 verses 12 to 13, where he would pick up a censer of burning coals from the incense altar. And in the sixth seal, this is thrown to the earth, which is physically an asteroid. Revelation 8 verse 3 to 5 says, Another angel came and stood at the altar. He had a golden censer and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints, God's people, on the golden altar in front of the throne. And the smoke and fragrant aroma of the incense with the prayers of the saints, God's people, ascended before God from the angel's hand. So the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth. And there was peals of thunder and loud rumblings and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. As you see from the scripture we just read, the asteroid impact that hits the earth causes an earthquake. But this is no ordinary earthquake. It is an unprecedented, massive, global, mega earthquake, which we will learn about in depth in episode 3, where we will see that this was prophesied about extensively in various places in scripture. For example, the prophet Isaiah said that it is such a severe impact and resultant earthquake that the earth literally breaks and twists around its axis, where the North Pole becomes the South Pole and the South Pole becomes the North Pole, and no island or mountain is left in the same place as it was before. It totally changes and devastates the entire geographical map and surface of the earth. So episode three is going to be very interesting when we learn about all of that. But this gives you a glimpse of how terrifying this display of Yahweh's power in the outpouring of his wrath and judgment is. And this earthquake is the event of the sixth seal described in Revelation 6 verse 12 to 17 where it says, when he, the lamb, broke open the sixth seal, I looked and there was a great earthquake, and the sun grew black as a sackcloth of hair. The full disk of the moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky dropped to the earth like a fig tree shedding its unripe fruit out of season when shaken by a strong wind. And that's describing the fallout of an asteroid again. For the great day of his wrath, vengeance, retribution has come, and who is able to stand before it? So here we see the words wrath, vengeance, and retribution, and that is describing the second prophetic aspect of the Day of Atonement. So in other words, these events of the sixth seal are taking place on the date of the Day of Atonement which is the biblical feast that is prophetically symbolic of the outpouring of Yahweh's wrath and judgment in the Great Tribulation. Notice that in Leviticus 26 verse 14, which described all that happened on the Day of Atonement as a foreshadow of the events in the sixth seal at the start of the Great Tribulation, you see the high priest Aaron sprinkling blood on the altar of the mercy seat seven times. This is connected to the asteroid impact and resultant global mega earthquake in the book of Revelation, which then sets off the seventh seal, which is the triggering of the seven trumpets, where each of those trumpets signify a series of catastrophic events 
that are caused by this global mega earthquake. But as I said, we will learn about all of that in detail in episode three. The third aspect of the Day of Atonement is the establishing of the kingdom and authority of the Messiah on earth, which is fulfilled when the Great Tribulation ends, which happens at the sixth trumpet. At this time, the Battle of Armageddon takes place, which is described in Revelations 19 verse 19, where Yeshua has his triumphant return with heaven's armies, which is his worshipping warrior bride who is riding with him. He defeats the Antichrist and throws the false prophet, the Antichrist and Satan alive into the lake of fire, as it says in Revelations 20 verse 10. And so in removing Satan, the Antichrist, and everything associated with his kingdom of darkness from the earth, the entire earth is cleansed of sin, which is the final ultimate fulfillment of all that the biblical feast of the Day of Atonement represents. And then Yeshua establishes his kingdom and authority on earth as he sets up his throne in Jerusalem to rule and reign with his bride on earth for a thousand years. Here are three scriptures in Isaiah which all mention the day of vengeance, meaning it as a reference to the day of atonement. But each describes one of the three different attributes of fulfillment of the day of atonement. Firstly, Isaiah 63 verse 4 says, For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption bringing salvation to his people has come. This is the first aspect of salvation. Yeshua's blood on the cross provides atonement. Then Isaiah 34 verse 8 says, For Yahweh has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution, showing forth power in vengeance to uphold Zion's cause. This is a demonstration of his power, judgment, and outpouring of his wrath in the Great Tribulation. And then Isaiah 61 verse 2 says, To proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor, giving authority to rulers in his kingdom, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. This is establishing his kingdom and authority when Yeshua returns with his bride at the Battle of Armageddon to defeat the Antichrist and set up his throne in Jerusalem to rule and reign with his bride on earth for a thousand years. So in summary, the word atonement is all about purification and cleansing of sin through paying the price which scripture calls the wages for that sin. And this is accomplished through the three different prophetic aspects of the Day of Atonement, which is salvation, the demonstration of his power in judgment in the Great Tribulation, and the establishment of his kingdom and authority as he defeats the Antichrist and removes Satan and sin from this earth. And interestingly, we see all of these attributes listed together in Revelations 12 verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers, which is speaking of the devil, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. The first aspect of the Day of Atonement has already been fulfilled at Yeshua's first coming. The last two aspects will be fulfilled at the time of Yeshua's second coming. Between the events of the sixth seal, when the Great Tribulation begins, and the sixth trumpet, when the Great Tribulation ends. There was a very interesting occasion where Yeshua demonstrated this one day in the synagogue where he read out Isaiah chapter 61 
which is actually all about the Day of Atonement. Let's first read the scripture in Isaiah that he quoted. Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. The spirit of Adonai Yahweh is upon me, because Yahweh has anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good news to the meek, the poor, and the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the physical and spiritual captives, and the opening of the prison and the eyes of those who are bound, to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garment of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a heavy, burdened and failing spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, lofty, strong and magnificent, distinguished for uprightness, justice and right standing with God, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified, and they shall rebuild the ancient ruins, they shall rise up the former desolations and renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Here we see the three aspects of the Day of Atonement. The acceptable year of Yahweh refers to salvation. The Day of Vengeance is the outpouring of His wrath and judgment in the time of the Great Tribulation. And the rest of the verse describes all that will take place at His triumphant return when the Tribulation ends as He defeats the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon and removes Satan from the earth and sets up his throne in Jerusalem and establishes his kingdom and authority on earth and rules and reigns on earth for a thousand years. But what I most wanted to point out in reading out the scripture is that there is something very significant to take notice of. Yeshua quoted the first part of the scripture but stopped right in the middle of verse 2 and he did not finish quoting the rest of the verse, for very good reason. Let's read about it in Luke 4, verses 16 to 20. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he entered the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and there was handed to him the roll of the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened and unrolled the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Adonai Yahweh is upon me, because he has anointed me, the Anointed One, the Messiah, to preach the gospel of good news to the poor. He sent me to announce release, pardon and forgiveness to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, downtrodden, bruised and crushed by tragedy to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. Then he rolled up the scroll, having stopped in the middle of the verse, and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were gazing attentively at him, and he began to speak to them. Today this scripture has been fulfilled while you are present and hearing. Yeshua quoted the first part of the verse, which is about the salvation that he had come to provide on the cross. That was fulfilled in his first coming when he was crucified. So that is why he spoke out that verse and said it is now fulfilled. But he stopped in the middle of the verse before completing the rest of it. You see, every minuscule detail in the Bible is there for a reason. The fact that he stopped in the middle of the verse is very significant. He stopped and did not say, and the day of vengeance of our God, because that part of the day of atonement was not fulfilled at his first coming. It is going to be fulfilled around the time of his second coming, in the second aspect of the Day of Atonement, which is the outpouring of God's wrath and judgment in the time of the Great Tribulation.
The month before the last three feasts of the Feast of Trumpets representing the rapture, the Day of Atonement representing the Great Tribulation, and the Feast of Tabernacles representing the time Yeshua rules and reigns with his bride for 1,000 years, is a very significant time called the month of Elul in the biblical calendar, which is known as the time when the king is in the field because he is in the fields representing the people of the world, as Yeshua explained in Matthew 13, verse 38, looking for a bridal harvest. In other words, looking to see if the fruit in his people has matured, if the fruits of the Holy Spirit and all the things of his character and nature has been cultivated in our lives so that we have been transformed in spirit, soul, and body back into his image. So this time when the king is in the field, in the month of Elul, in the 30 days leading up to the last three biblical feasts, is very significant because it is the time just before these seriously important end time events of the rapture and God's judgment. And it's a time of final preparation, a final time of repentance and searching our hearts before Abba Father as we anticipate the fulfillment of what the coming feasts represent. It's a time more than ever to do what this beautiful scripture in Psalm 5 verse 3 says, at each and every sunrise, you will hear my voice as I prepare my sacrifice of prayer to you. Every morning, I lay out the pieces of my life on the altar and wait for your fire to fall on my heart. What a stunning scripture. In Old Testament times, an outward symbolic act that the people would do, which we saw Daniel doing in his 21-day fast, which we read previously, as a representation of the work that they were allowing God to do in their hearts while they were fasting and repenting, is to put on sackcloth and cover themselves with ashes. It's a time of mourning in the sense of seriously humbling yourself before Abba Father in repentance. So in Isaiah chapter 61, notice how the oil of joy for mourning, beauty for ashes, a garment of praise, etc., is in this context of all that the Day of Atonement prophetically represents. And then you can see the relevance of this to what is taking place at the time of the second coming that being the mourning and repenting in the month of Elul, followed by the unimaginable joy of being raptured and taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the 30 days in the month of Elul, leading up to when the rapture happens at the Feast of Trumpets, is a time of repentance. And even more so, in the 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. These last 10 days leading up to the Day of Atonement are known as the 10 days of awe, because as the time of the Great Tribulation is coming to an end, the last 10 days of the Great Tribulation, before it ends at the Battle of Armageddon, is the very, very last 10 days and final chance for people to choose to enter God's kingdom through salvation and being born again and for their names to be written in the Lamb's book of life because there are many scriptures such as for example Luke 10 verse 20 that explain that when you accept Yeshua as your Savior and Messiah through what he did for us on the cross and you confess with your mouth that he is the Son of God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved through the salvation that Yeshua provided on the cross and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
And after the final millennium Sabbath rest, where Yeshua rules and reigns with his bride on earth for 1,000 years, which is what the Feast of Tabernacles is prophetically symbolic of, the next event is something in scripture called the Great White Throne Judgment. And every single person in history who ever lived from the time of Adam will stand before the Great White Throne on which Yahweh the Almighty God sits and the books will be opened and simply put, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will spend eternity in heaven with Abba Father and Yeshua. And those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will spend eternity, which is a very long, infinite amount of time, being tormented in the lake of fire in hell with the devil, the Antichrist, and all his demons forever and ever. So again, those last 10 days leading up to the Day of Atonement are known as the 10 days of awe. Because as the time of the Great Tribulation is coming to an end, the last 10 days of the Great Tribulation, before it ends at the Battle of Armageddon, is the very, very last 10 days. And it is the final chance for people to choose to enter God's kingdom through the salvation Yeshua provided on the cross and being born again and for their names to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because on the Day of Atonement, when Yeshua returns on his white horse, the books are closed for judgment and there is no more chance after that. So for those who are still sitting on the fence in between, the verdict remains open for those last 10 days until the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur when the books are closed. And so if their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life by then, that's it. There is no more time and no more chance. When the Day of Atonement is celebrated as a part of the biblical feast every year, at the end of the day, the shofar is blown with one long blast that resounds and echoes for the last time as heaven's gates are closing. So there is 30 days in the month of Elul, followed by 10 days of awe leading up to the Day of Atonement, which is 40 days in total that is given for preparation through fasting, repentance and sanctification of our hearts before Abba Father. Remember, as I explained previously, the number 40 is a time of testing like when Yeshua fasted for 40 days and was tempted in the desert. The number 40 is a time that Yahweh gives us to apply his blood to our lives through repentance and sanctify our hearts through renewing our minds with his word, which is what washes our wedding garments in preparation for when he comes to fetch his bride. At the rapture for the marriage supper of the Lamb, at the Feast of Trumpets, and so that we can avoid having to go through his judgment in the Great Tribulation, which begins on the Day of Atonement. Remember, we saw the same pattern of 40 in the 40 Jubilees, which is 2,000 years between Yeshua's first coming, where he shed his blood to give us the opportunity to apply his blood to our lives through a lifestyle of repentance and sanctification so that we can be prepared for the events surrounding his second coming, including the rapture. And we saw the same pattern of 40 years from the time Yeshua was crucified, where the people of Israel were given a chance to repent 
before they finally experienced Yahweh's judgment with the destruction of the second temple and city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we see the same pattern of 40 days here given as an opportunity for repentance before judgment falls in the great tribulation on the day of atonement. So now we've had an overview of the day of atonement and the three different aspects or three different prophetic fulfillments of the day of atonement. In episode three, we'll learn in depth about the two prophetic aspects of Yom Kippur or the day of atonement concerning the great tribulation and how it ends with the battle of Armageddon and Yeshua establishing his kingdom on earth for a thousand years in the final millennium. But for now, let's zoom back in to this part of Yom Kippur, which represents the salvation that Yeshua provided for us when he died on the cross and the shedding of his blood that provided atonement for our sins. And how he carried our sins for us, which was represented by the two goats, where one was sacrificed as a sin offering and its blood sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, and the other goat, called the scapegoat, was released into the wilderness, symbolically carrying away the sins of the people. With a scarlet red cloth around its neck, which every year for 1,500 years would miraculously turn white. As a sign that Yahweh had accepted the sacrifice of atonement given for the people that year on the biblical feast of Yom Kippur, which was the Day of Atonement. And now let's see how all this background understanding that I have taken a lot of time to give you now provides astonishingly interesting evidence to when on the timeline Yeshua was crucified. So far, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel that we have now learnt about in depth has pointed to 30 AD as the year that the Messiah died on the cross. And we learnt that the prophecy of Jonah indicated that unless the people repented for their murder and rejection of the Son of God, in 40 years the temple and the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed and the people scattered in captivity to all nations across the earth. And it is a fixed historical fact that it definitely happened in 70 AD. And so 40 years before 70 AD also takes you to 30 AD. Now let's add to those two pieces of evidence by looking at some other very interesting things that took place in the temple and on the Day of Atonement, in those 40 years between 30 AD and 70 AD, when the Temple and Jerusalem were finally destroyed. After 30 AD, the scarlet red woolen cloth around the scapegoat's neck and on the temple door never turned white again. It remained red, indicating that the usual Old Testament sacrifices they offered to Yahweh were no longer acceptable to him for the atonement of their sins. Secondly, the most important lamp of the seven candlestick menorah in the temple went out and would not shine. Thirdly, when they cast lots to determine which of the two goats would be the sin offering, and which one would be the scapegoat or Azazel. Every year for those 40 years, the lot fell into the left hand. And lastly, even though the doors of the temple were closed every evening, they would wake up in the morning to find that the temple doors had mysteriously opened by themselves. And this undoubtedly freaked the priests and the Jewish people out as they were totally confounded as to why these strange events were taking place. Let's have a look at some historical writings that document these events. 
and then we'll have a look at the significance and meaning of these events that took place in those 40 years, starting from 30 AD after Yeshua was crucified until the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. In historical writings documented by Jewish rabbis in the Jerusalem Talmud, it says, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the western light went out, the crimson thread remained crimson, and the lot for the Lord always came up in the left hand. They would close the gates of the temple by night and get up in the morning and find them wide open. There is also a documentation of these same events in the Babylonian Talmud, which says, our rabbis taught during the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the lot for the Lord did not come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson colored strap become white, nor did the westernmost light shine, and the doors of the Hekal, which was the temple, would remain open by themselves. And it has further been taught, for 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the thread of scarlet never turned white, but it remained red. Since both the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmud document the same events, it is an indication that the knowledge of these events was widespread and known and accepted by the majority of the Jewish community. But let's now look at the incredible mind-blowing significance of each of these events. As I mentioned previously, the scarlet red woolen cloth that was put around the Azazel scapegoat's neck and on the temple door turned white every year for 1,500 years. But after 30 AD, that never happened again for 40 years until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, resulting in the cessation of all temple rituals. Isn't that amazing? This was a clear sign to the Jewish people of Israel that the usual Old Testament sacrifices that they offered to Yahweh on Yom Kippur were no longer acceptable to him for the atonement of their sins and that the sins of the whole community had not been pardoned or made white as they had expected. And as you can imagine, this greatly disturbed the Jews leaving them totally baffled, perplexed, and undoubtedly very worried as to why something had so drastically changed from the year 30 AD, where Yahweh no longer accepted their sacrifices as an atonement for their sins on the day of Yom Kippur. So this was a clear indication that atonement for their sins now had to be gained in another way. But who or what would provide this atonement for another year? Well, I think for most of us, the reason is obvious. Because Yeshua had died on the cross in 30 AD, becoming the ultimate sacrifice, where his shed blood paid the price for our sins once and for all, thereby nullifying the need for any further animal sacrifices on the Day of Atonement because the blood of Yeshua had now provided the atonement for sins and therefore atonement for our sins can no longer be obtained through animal sacrifice. Which was explained in Hebrews 10 verses 11 to 13, which we read together earlier. When we accept what Yeshua did on the cross for us to pay the price for our sin on our behalf, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, accepting him into our heart and life as our Saviour and Messiah, and confessing with our mouth that he is the Son of God, we are saved through the redemption that he provided for us on the cross, as Romans 10 verse 9 says. And when we apply the blood of Yeshua to our lives through repentance, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, the blood of Yeshua washes us of all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua is now the only possible way 
for atonement of our sins. And that is why the scarlet cloth no longer turned from scarlet red representing sin to white representing being cleansed of sin on the Day of Atonement from 30 AD onwards because Yeshua fulfilled this when he was crucified because only his blood can wash us of our unrighteousness until we are as white as snow. My dear friends, I hope that you realize the very great significance of this little detail that I've just shared with you here. The fact that the scarlet red crimson cloth did not turn white every year for 40 years after 30 AD proves two very big important things. That Yeshua was indeed crucified in 30 AD. And secondly, that Yeshua is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. This one little detail of the Day of Atonement, where the scarlet cord around the scapegoat's neck and on the temple door turned white on the Day of Atonement every year for 1,500 years, and then from the exact year Yeshua was crucified in 30 AD, this miracle no longer took place every year for 40 years until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, has opened the eyes of some Jewish people in recent years to the revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah, as they then understood that his blood on the cross provided atonement for our sins. And so, my dear friends, the understanding of this little detail right here about the scarlet red cloth is a major tool that you now have in your arsenal to share with your Jewish brothers and sisters, as well as all other people who do not yet know him, to plant a seed in their hearts to point them towards the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah as the Son of God. And in fact, as I shared in a lot more depth in the first video on the seven biblical feasts, it's the seven biblical feasts that Yahweh is going to use to remove the veil from the eyes of the Jewish people of Israel at his appointed time in the end times to reveal to them that Yeshua is the Messiah, just like that part in a traditional wedding ceremony where the veil is removed from in front of the face of the bride so that she can clearly see her bridegroom because every little detail in the seven biblical feasts is about Yeshua. And as I said at the end of the introduction video, the book of Revelation literally means to remove the veil. The book of Revelation is a revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior, Redeemer, Bridegroom, and King. For 1,500 years, a supernatural miracle took place every year on the biblical feast of Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, where the cloth that was tied to the Azazel scapegoat and temple door turned from scarlet red to white as an indication that Yahweh had accepted the blood sacrifice of the goats and bulls on Yom Kippur as an atonement for the sins of the people that year. But from 30 AD, when Yeshua was crucified, that never happened again. The scarlet red cloth remained red and did not turn white every year for 40 years until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, which brought all the temple rituals and sacrifices to an end. Because through his blood shed on the cross for us, there was a transference of the atonement for sins, which we saw in the scriptures in Hebrews is no longer achieved through the two goats that were offered as a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. But in 30 AD, 
the innocent, spotless, sinless Passover lamb, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua the Messiah, was put to death and sacrificed on the cross, although no fault was found in him. Just like there had to be no fault, spot or blemish in the two goats previously used on the Day of Atonement. But unlike temple sacrifices on the Day of Atonement, where the people's sin was only covered over for the year and had to be atoned for again the next year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the blood of Yeshua our Messiah that was shed through his sacrifice on the cross provided the opportunity for us to be forgiven and cleansed of our sins once and for all time when we choose to apply his blood to our lives through repentance and when through his undeserved mercy and grace we choose to accept a personal love relationship with Yahweh our Abba Father through what his son our Savior and Messiah did for us on the cross and Yeshua's sacrifice for our sin on the cross to provide redemption for all mankind, for anybody who is willing to accept him as their Savior and Messiah is a one-time event for each person and no longer requires animal sacrifices every year on the Day of Atonement because Yeshua has now fulfilled the first aspect of the prophetic fulfillment of the Day of Atonement where he has provided salvation redemption and the atonement of our sins. In John 14 verse 6, Yeshua answers the question to the mystery that has baffled the Jews since the scarlet cloth no longer turned white, which left them so worried as to why something had so drastically changed from the year 30 AD where Yahweh no longer accepted their sacrifices as an atonement for their sins on the day of Yom Kippur, as a clear indication that atonement for their sins now had to be gained in another way, and what or who would provide this atonement for their sins. Yeshua gave the answer in John 14 verse 6, where he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, as indicated by the miracle of the cloth that was tied to the Azazel scapegoat and temple door, turning from scarlet red to white, no longer happening from 30 AD, according to multiple historical witnesses and accounts, testifies to the fact that the mechanism of providing forgiveness of sin through the Day of Atonement clearly changed in 30 AD. And from Scripture, the only possible event that could explain such a significant change is that this was the year that the Messiah was crucified. But let's continue to look at even more evidence since two to three witnesses establish a matter. We want to bring several more witnesses to the table as it relates to 30 AD being the year that Yeshua was crucified, since this event is such a key pinpoint that helps us establish where we are on the timeline and biblical time clock, which then later on will show us where we are in the end days Book of Revelation timeline. The second drastic change and miracle that took place in the temple every day for 40 years from the time Yeshua was crucified in 30 AD until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD was that the most important lamp of the seven candlestick menorah in the temple went out by itself and would not shine every night. No matter what precautions and efforts the priests made to prevent this specific candle on the menorah from going out, it still went out by itself for every night in a row for 14,600 nights during those 40 years. The mathematical probability of that specific candle 
out of the seven candles on the menorah going out every night for 14,600 nights in a row during those 40 years is astronomical. The mathematical odds and probability is one in trillions. So clearly something supernatural was going on. Again, causing much concern and consternation amongst the priests of the temple and the Jewish people of Israel, because what this signified is that Yahweh's presence had left the building. Ernest Martin wrote in research he did on this topic. In fact, we are told in the Talmud that at dusk, the lamps that were unlit in the day, the middle four lamps remained unlit, while the two eastern lamps normally stayed lit during the day, were to be relit from the flames of the western lamp. This western lamp was to be kept lit at all times. For this reason, the priests kept extra reservoirs of olive oil and other implements in ready supply to make sure that the western lamp under all circumstances would stay lit. But what happened in the 40 years prior to the, to the very year the Messiah said the physical temple would be destroyed? Every night for 40 years, the western lamp went out, and this in spite of the priests each evening preparing in a special way the western lamp so that it would remain constantly burning all night. From 30 AD, this light of the menorah went out, signifying Yahweh's presence and spirit had left the temple building. Why? Because, as we learned earlier from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17, the body of Christ is now the temple where his presence and his Holy Spirit dwells. When we become born again, by accepting Yeshua as our Savior and Messiah, and we are filled with His Holy Spirit, our body becomes His temple, and we are now living tabernacles. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 to 17 says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So even though there is going to be another third temple that is going to be built in the end times, as a Christian, don't have anything to do with it, because we don't need a physical temple. We are the temple as the body of Christ. So in 30 AD, Yahweh's presence and spirit left the physical temple in Jerusalem. And the only reasonable explanation for this, according to scripture, is the crucifixion of the Messiah at this time, which resulted in the transference of Yahweh's presence and spirit from the physical stone temple to a temple of flesh, the body of Christ just like Ezekiel prophesied would happen in Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. Then they will be my people and I will will be their God, Elohim. As we read just now, three of the seven candles of the menorah were lit in the temple during the day, one candle on the western side and two candles on the eastern side. Now what could be the significance and meaning of this? Well, to understand that, I first just need to take a few minutes to tell you about the menorah and how it helps us to understand Abba Father's prophetic patterns in scripture and unlock their meaning, especially his patterns of seven. And I just want to emphasize that the menorah is not a Jewish thing. 
It is a biblical thing that originates from God, who gave the design of the menorah to Moses in Exodus chapter 25, which is also described as a lampstand, and it still has plenty of relevance to us today. For example, you see the menorah described in heaven in Revelation chapter 1, where it talks about Yeshua walking between seven lampstands, which is seven menorahs, which represents the seven churches. The menorah actually represents you and me and anybody who is born again. It is gold, which represents the image of God. And the lights on the candles represent the fact that we are meant to be a light to the world as we walk in the image of God and demonstrate his character and who he is through our lives to those around us. So, for example, when we walk in peace, joy, love, forgiveness, and all of those things that represent the character and nature of God, we are doing what the menorah represents. There is no time to explain the menorah in detail, but I have already done a video explaining the significance of the menorah to the end time bride of Christ, which is freely available on our YouTube channel at the title and link shown on the screen. If you haven't watched it already, I recommend making a note to go have a look at it sometime because there are some special treasures there. But among many other things, the menorah is a key. Just like you would put a key into a lock to unlock a door, the menorah is literally a key that you can put into the Word of God to unlock a lot of revelation. And using the menorah to connect the patterns of seven in Scripture has really helped me personally to unlock a lot of the meaning and understanding of the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation is based on the pattern of sevens. And what the menorah does is help you to connect the patterns of sevens together so that you can see where everything fits in and goes together. For example, there is a lot of debate about a pre-trib, mid-trib or post-trib rapture. And people who have strong convictions about one of those options is because each of those beliefs is based on a few scriptures. But you have to bring all the pieces of the puzzle together from the different prophecies in scripture in order to see the whole big picture and understand how everything fits in and falls into place. And that is what the menorah helps you to do. So I'll be explaining that as far as the rapture goes in a later episode in the series of the timeline of the book of Revelation. But what I want to do with the menorah now is to show you how we can use it to unlock revelation of the meaning and significance of three of the seven candles of the menorah which were lit in the temple during the day. One candle on the western side and two candles on the eastern side. And what we need to do first is match the seven biblical feasts onto the pattern of the menorah. And then the three candles that were lit coincides with Passover, which is prophetically symbolic of when Yeshua was crucified. That's the western lamp that went out after Yeshua fulfilled this feast by being crucified on this exact day of Passover. And then the other two lamps on the east side coincides with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is prophetically symbolic of the Great Tribulation when God's judgment hits the earth. And then the other lit lamp coincides with the Feast of Tabernacles, which is where Yeshua sets up his throne in Jerusalem and establishes his kingdom and authority on earth as he rules and reigns with his bride for the final 1,000 years. Now, does that perhaps ring a bell in your mind? Remember, that is the three prophetic aspects of the Day of Atonement. 
The first aspect is salvation, where Yeshua's blood on the cross provided atonement for our sins, which happened at Passover. And this was the light that went out because this has been fulfilled. The second aspect is a demonstration of Yahweh's power. As his judgment hits the earth in the time of the great tribulation, which begins on the Day of Atonement. The third aspect is establishing his kingdom and authority. When Yeshua returns with his bride at the Battle of Armageddon to defeat the Antichrist and set up his throne in Jerusalem to rule and reign with his bride on earth for a thousand years which is what the Feast of Tabernacles is prophetically symbolic of. The first candle on the west coincides with Passover, which represents when Yeshua was crucified and provided salvation, which is the first aspect of the Day of Atonement being fulfilled. So that's why that specific candle went out. The two candles on the east side of the menorah coincides with the two prophetic aspects of the Day of Atonement that still need to be fulfilled in the end days during the time of the Book of Revelation, which is the Great Tribulation, and when Yeshua comes back at the end of the Tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon to defeat the Antichrist and set up his kingdom on earth as he rules and reigns with his bride for the final 1,000 years. These events have not yet happened and have not yet been fulfilled, which is why those two candles remained lit. But as we are going to see in this video series on the timeline of the book of Revelation, it won't be long before these last two prophetic events are about to be fulfilled and literally take place. But for now, the western light on the menorah representing Passover when Yeshua would be crucified on the cross, going out from 30 AD, is another piece of evidence that this was the year that the prophetic meaning of Passover and the first aspect of the Day of Atonement was fulfilled. When our Messiah died, was buried and resurrected. But there's more. Remember, on the Day of Atonement, when the two goats were selected, lots were thrown to determine which of the goats would be sacrificed as a sin offering given to Yahweh and which goat would become the Azazel scapegoat. Apparently, the way these lots were cast was by using two stones, one white stone and one black stone. The white stone falling into the right hand was Yahweh's lot. And according to Leviticus 16 verse 9, the goat that the white stone would fall on would be the goat that would be sacrificed as a sin offering. Where the red blood of the goat would symbolically wash away the sins of the people to make them as white as snow. As we also saw symbolically represented in the red scarlet cloth turning white. According to some historical accounts, Long before 30 AD, there was a high priest named Simon, who was a very righteous man before Yahweh, and who served as a high priest in the temple for 40 years. The people of Israel noticed that the scarlet cloth associated with his person always turned white when he entered the Holy of Holies in the temple, and they also noted that the white lot, which was Yahweh's lot, came up every year for 40 years in a row, during the time that this righteous high priest Simon served. Then in the years after Simon, when other people served as the high priest in the temple, the people of Israel noticed that on some years the lot picked would be the black stone and sometimes the white stone. But according to historical Jewish writings, after 30 AD, Every year for 40 years, the high priest always picked the black stone and the lot always fell into the left hand. Now remember that the lots had an equal 50-50 chance of falling either way. When the priest picked one of the two stones, 
the selection was based purely by chance. And so some mathematicians have calculated that the odds of the black stone coming up in the left hand every year in a row for 40 years is 2 to the 40th power, which translates to the number shown on the screen, which is just over 1 in 1 trillion. Which means, mathematically speaking, that this is basically impossible to just randomly happen. It is clearly obvious that there was a supernatural hand involved here. The fact that only the black stone was selected and only fell in the left hand for 40 years in a row not only symbolized that something significant had happened in 30 AD, but it was a dire event, symbolic of impending judgment soon to come. And as you can imagine, this caused much stir, fear and trembling amongst the Jewish people of Israel. And then there was a fourth miracle that the ancient Jewish authorities acknowledged that took place, in the 40 years after 30 AD that totally freaked the Jewish people out, which was that the temple doors swung open every night completely by themselves without anybody touching the doors. Every night for 40 years, this was the case beginning in 30 AD. The Jewish authority and leader of the community of Israel at the time called Johanan ben Zakkai, understood what this meant from a prophecy in Zechariah 11 verse 1, which declared that this was a sign of impending doom and judgment where the temple would be destroyed. As he wrote in the Jerusalem Talmud, said Johanan ben Zakkai to the temple, O temple, why do you frighten us? We know that you will end up destroyed. For it has been said, open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. And the Jewish leader, Johanan ben Zakkai, did live to witness the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. As we saw in the prophecy of Jonah, the Jews' rejection of Yeshua and crucifying him on the cross began a time of great trouble and tribulation for the Jewish people of Israel marking the beginning of 40 years of testing, the last opportunity for them to repent before facing judgment in 70 AD, where the temple and whole city was destroyed and the women were raped, their children killed, and all of the remaining people were taken into bondage, captivity and slavery in foreign nations where they were trampled upon and persecuted for 1,878 years before they were finally given the chance to return to their homeland in 1948. Yeshua prophesied about that coming judgment, even whilst he was walking on the road, carrying the cross to where he would be crucified, where he warned the women of Jerusalem of the terrible things they were going to endure in the near future in Luke 23, verse 28 to 30, Yeshua turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. But there was also a positive significance to the doors of the temple swinging open and the veil separating the inner court and the Holy of Holies being torn in two when Yeshua died on the cross. And that is that it is not only the priest who is allowed to enter Yahweh's presence in the Holy of Holies, but Yeshua, our high priest, has opened the doors and the veil for all of us to enter into his presence in the heavenly holy of holies by faith any time that we like, to fellowship with him in a deep, intimate love relationship with him, and the doors of Yahweh's house of worship are open to anybody who is willing to enter in. Matthew 27 verse 50 to 51 
And when Yeshua cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth was shaken and the rocks were split. Hebrews 10 verse 19 to 22 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Yeshua, by his death, Yeshua opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with the Messiah's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. I can't help but notice in the scripture the mention of the blood of Yeshua that cleanses us like soap, and the encouragement to now wash our bodies with pure water, which is the washing of the water of the word. In other words, Hebrews 10 verse 19 to 21 is encouraging us to go through the preparation process of becoming his bride for that amazing moment mentioned in Luke 21 verse 26, when we get to stand before the Son of Man, our Messiah, Bridegroom and King, our precious High Priest, in front of the altar, the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies and enter into a marriage covenant with him at the wedding feast and marriage supper of the Lamb. So in summary, there are four very significant miracles that took place in the temple for 40 years, beginning in 30 AD until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Firstly, after 30 AD, the scarlet red woolen cloth around the Azazel scapegoat's neck never turned white. It remained red, indicating that the usual Old Testament sacrifices they offered to Yahweh were no longer acceptable to him for the atonement of their sins. Secondly, the most important lamp of the seven candlestick menorah in the temple went out and would not shine, indicating that Yahweh's presence and spirit had left the temple building. Thirdly, when they cast lots to determine which of the two goats would be the sin offering and which one would be the scapegoat or Azazel, every year for those 40 years, the priest picked the black stone and the lot fell into the left hand, which was a dire sign of impending judgment. And lastly, even though the doors of the temple were closed every evening, they would wake up in the morning to find the temple doors had mysteriously opened by themselves, which according to scripture was another sign of coming judgment in which the temple would be destroyed. These four significant events that took place in the temple for 40 years, beginning in 30 AD, was such a big deal that it was documented in multiple historical accounts and was the subject of much discussion amongst the Jewish nation, as it absolutely dumbfounded and puzzled the priesthood and the people of Israel. The only thing that they knew is that something had seriously and drastically changed concerning the Day of Atonement sacrifice because of something very profound that happened in 30 AD. And the book of Hebrews, which focuses on the biblical feast of the Day of Atonement, opens up this mystery to us, that all four of these miracles in the temple were because of what the Messiah accomplished for us on the cross. Remember that the first of the seven biblical feasts is the feast of Passover, which was prophetically symbolic of when Yeshua would be crucified, which he was on the exact date of Passover at the exact time that they would sacrifice the Passover lamb. 
because he was the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. According to multiple witnesses in scripture and historical accounts, Yeshua our Messiah offered himself as a sacrifice for sin by dying for us on the cross on Passover, which according to Leviticus 23 verse 5 is on the 14th day of Nisan, which is the first month in the biblical calendar, which in 30 AD was on Wednesday, the 5th of April, in the Gregorian calendar the world uses. Now having said that, hopefully a very good question is popping into your mind. I thought Jesus died on a Friday, because that is what is traditionally taught about Easter, that Jesus died on Good Friday and was resurrected on Sunday. When I was a young child, I used to wonder, what's wrong with the story? Can't people count basic nursery school maths? Matthew 12 verse 40 says, For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Scripture clearly says that Yeshua was physically dead and in the heart of the earth, which is hell, for three days and three nights. If he was crucified on Friday and resurrected on Sunday, that means that he was buried for two nights. Friday night, night one, and Saturday night, night two, and then resurrected on Sunday? Where is night three? That is not three days and three nights according to scripture. In a later episode of this Book of Revelation series, I will share with you that Easter is not the same as the Biblical Feast of Passover that represents all that Yeshua did for us on the cross. Easter, along with its traditions of the Easter eggs, the Easter bunny and all of that, originates from the pagan, occultic, satanic traditions of Babylon which in later episodes, when we study Revelation 17 and 18, you will see will be the same occultic, satanic, Babylon one-world religion of the Antichrist in the time of the book of Revelation. Easter was introduced into the Christian church by the Roman Emperor Constantine in 365 AD, at the same time that he removed the biblical feasts. Because in the Roman Empire, they practiced the exact same religion of ancient Babylon. It just took on a different cloak where the names of their demonic gods, etc. were changed to suit Roman names and the Roman culture at the time. But it was still essentially the same ancient Babylon religion, which is the Baal worship of Lucifer. And it was from the leadership of the Roman Empire that the Roman Catholic Church was birthed. And the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church are Freemasons, which again is the one day version of the ancient Babylon religion, which will be the same end time religion of the Antichrist. Not only did the Roman Emperor Constantine exchange the biblical feasts for the pagan traditions of Babylon in the Christian church, but as is clearly recorded in historical documents, such as one that is quoted on the screen, the Roman Emperor Constantine and the Roman Catholic Church also changed the Sabbath day set by Abba Father in Genesis 2 verse 2 from a Saturday to a Sunday. Because the occultic religion of Babylon and Egypt is centered around worship of the sun or what is called sun god worship which is the Baal worship of Lucifer, hence the name Sunday. Daniel prophesied that this would happen in Daniel 7 verse 25, where he said that the Antichrist and those in his Babylon religion, which is the Baal worship of Lucifer, would change Yahweh's appointed times 
and remove his kingdom ways from the Christian church and from the rest of the world. Anyway, that is why the whole story in Easter of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday doesn't make sense in terms of counting the days and nights Yeshua was in the tomb. And that's why it doesn't fit in with scripture, because it's not from Abba Father and it's not from the Bible. As I mentioned previously, Yeshua was crucified on Wednesday, the 5th of April in 30 AD, in the Gregorian calendar that the world uses. Matthew 12 verse 40 says, He was in the belly of the earth after he died, where his spirit went to hell for three days and three nights. Now in the biblical way of timekeeping, a day is defined as the time between one period of darkness to the next period of darkness, which varies in length between the different seasons of summer and winter. Matthew 24 verse 45 said that it had been dark for three hours from the sixth hour, which is 12 noon, until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. In biblical timekeeping, that is defined as a night, regardless of what time of day the darkness was, or how long the darkness was, that was a night. So when Yeshua died and gave up his spirit on the cross at the ninth hour, which was about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, when the darkness lifted, that was the beginning of day one, where Yeshua had just died and where his spirit had gone to the belly of the earth. So day one was from 3 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon when it became daylight again until sundown on Wednesday evening. Wednesday night was night one. Thursday during the day was day two. Thursday night was night two. Friday during the day was day three and Friday night was night three. And then he rose on the seventh day on Saturday morning on Shabbat, which is the Sabbath. And that has a lot of significance to it. And it fits in with all Abba Father's biblical patterns in scripture. If you're hearing this for the first time, sorry if I've rocked your boat a bit in terms of challenging what might be your current theology. But again, I encourage you to rejoice that some of you are being restored to truth. And you don't have to believe me, you can go and test this against the scriptures for yourself. And also research in history for yourself in terms of how history unfolded in comparison with the scriptures. In the official Easter story, even if you take into account Friday afternoon as day one, because of the period of darkness at midday, just before Jesus died, you are still missing a day and a night. But we have now uncovered a lot of evidence that Yeshua was crucified on Passover in 30 AD, which was a Wednesday, meaning that he would have risen on the seventh day on a Sabbath day, which is a Saturday which, as I mentioned, has a tremendous amount of significance to it. Even if you look on any Gregorian calendar that the world uses, Sunday is still marked as the first day of the week, and Saturday is the seventh day of the week, which is when Yahweh originally rested, as we see in Genesis 2 verse 2. By the seventh day, God Elohim, the Almighty Creator, had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And just out of interest, here is a quote from the Catholic record London, Ontario, September 1, 1923. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. So there you have it, straight from the horse's mouth. It is always somewhat laughable to see the Protestant churches 
in pulpit and legislation demand the observance of Sunday, of which there is nothing in their Bible. Peter R. Kramer, Catholic Church Extension Magazine, USA, 1975. But in Scripture, Yahweh says in Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11, Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh, your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, your livestock, and any foreigners living amongst you. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So who are you going to follow and obey? The Antichrist Beast Kingdom of Rome? Or Yahweh's instructions in Scripture. The Jews celebrate Shabbat on the correct day, which is a Saturday, and they have enjoyed tremendous blessing as a result. But again, just like the biblical feasts, the proper Sabbath day is not a Jewish thing, and it's not a Seventh day Adventist thing, it's a biblical thing. It's a scriptural kingdom principle instituted by Yahweh and his instructions in righteousness do not change. Because again, Hebrews 13 verse 8 says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you want a New Testament scripture, here is one in Hebrews 4 verse 9. So then it remains for the people of God to keep the Sabbath. The fact that Yeshua rose on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day, is very prophetically significant concerning the end times and the book of Revelations, because it was a foreshadow of the rapture, which happens on a jubilee year, which is also a Sabbath rest. And it is also a foreshadow of the first resurrection that scripture speaks about, that happens on the seventh day at the beginning of the final 1,000 years, which is the seventh millennium, where all those who were martyred during the Great Tribulation for refusing to accept the mark of the beast and refusing to deny their faith in Yeshua the Messiah are resurrected to join the bride to rule and reign with Yeshua from Jerusalem in the final 1,000 years millennium Sabbath rest. But I will explain the first resurrection in a lot more depth in a future episode because this is a big topic in itself. But in time we will see how all these biblical prophetic patterns all fit together, adding layer after layer of evidence to all that I am sharing here. Including the significance of Yeshua raising from the dead on Shabbat, the Sabbath. Now, whether you go to church on a Sunday or a Wednesday night or whenever, it doesn't matter. As long as you don't make a habit of forsaking fellowship with other believers, as Hebrews 10 verse 25 says. But the emphasis of Shabbat is family time. It's a sweet blessing for families. And time to spend in Abba Father's presence and feasting on his word. And it's a time to rest spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. And as I said earlier in this video, when something is really from Abba Father, you will see the fingerprint of it somewhere in creation. For example, the human body is designed to run in cycles. For example, you have daily cycles where your hormones and organ systems are running at different levels at different parts of the day. To give one example, in the morning, the hormone levels of cortisol are higher to wake you up and enable you to concentrate and give you energy and motivation for the day. But in the evening, cortisol levels are designed to subside and the levels of a hormone called melatonin are raised and released to make you sleepy and get you ready to have deep healing, refreshing sleep. 
And as well as daily cycles, your body also has monthly cycles. I think all women know an example of that. And your body also has weekly cycles. And interestingly, all the organ systems of your body slow down on a Saturday, implying that a Saturday is when the human body was designed and created to rest. It's been well proven in medical research that if you sleep during the day, you don't get anywhere near the health benefits than if you sleep at the right times at night when your immune system is rejuvenated, etc. And that's why shift workers who have to work at night and sleep during the day have a higher incidence of infections, cancer, and other diseases. And in the same way, if you rest on another day of the week, you don't get anywhere near the health benefits that you get if you rest on the proper Shabbat. I have already produced a video explaining in depth the importance of the original Sabbath from both a medical and biblical perspective and all the wonderful blessing and richness it brings, not only in our health and finances, but in every area of life. This video is freely available on YouTube and later on Rumble, and you can find it in the link in the description below this video. It will become an important necessary background video to watch later on in this series when we see how the principle of the Sabbath is an important puzzle piece to the whole timeline of the book of Revelation. So if you watch that video sometime when you have time, it would be good, but we'll remind you about it later as well when it becomes important to the part of the story we are covering in the book of Revelation. So all of that was to explain why Yeshua our Messiah offered himself as a sacrifice for sin by dying for us on the cross on Passover, which according to Leviticus 23 verse 5 is on the 14th day of Nisan, which is the first month in the biblical calendar, which in the Roman Gregorian calendar that the world uses was on Wednesday the 5th of April in 30 AD. And so now you understand why it was a Wednesday and not a Friday, as many Christians have thought, because of the infiltration of Freemasonry into the Christian church, which introduced these deceptions and pagan traditions of Babylon into so many Christians' lives across the world for so many centuries. So far, we have seen how the prophecy of Daniel unfolded with pinpoint accuracy, pointing to 30 AD as the year that Yeshua died on the cross for us. And then the evidence of 30 AD being the year of the Messiah's crucifixion has been added to by the prophecy of Jonah. And those four very significant, well-documented historical events that took place in the temple for 40 years between 30 AD and 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Now remember that just the incident of casting of the lots with the two stones, where for 40 years in a row, the lot fell on the black stone on the left hand, that alone had a mathematical probability of over one in one trillion. Then if you add to that the exact same candle out of the seven candles going out every night for 40 years, which is 14,600 nights in a row, the mathematical probability of that incident alone is so astronomical, you can't even put the number on the screen just for that one event. And adding to that, the other two significant events that took place in the temple in those 40 years, and then adding to that the mathematical probability that the six dates of the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy and Jonah prophecy fell exactly and precisely into place, which alone also has 
a mathematical probability that is so astronomical that you can't even put the number on the screen. And then in combining the one in one trillion with the astronomical mathematical probabilities of all these evidences I have presented so far together, you can't even express the number. It's a one in infinity chance of it being incorrect that Yeshua was crucified in 30 AD and that Yeshua is the Son of God. In other words, it's close to impossible. I still have lots more to share, but just based on each piece of evidence I have given so far in this first video, we have proven beyond any reasonable doubt that Yeshua was crucified in 30 AD and that he is the Son of God. But that hardly scratches the tip of the iceberg. We're only getting started. There is a multitude of other layers of evidence in many scriptures to come in the future episodes of the series, which all point to the same conclusion, that 30 AD is indeed the true year of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah and Son of God. And the reason I have taken so much time to give evidence to firmly establish the date that Yeshua was crucified is because, as I have mentioned many times now, it is a major pinpoint on the timeline that Scripture has given us to reorientate us to where we are on the biblical time clock. In a later episode, I am going to build on this foundation that we have established here in this video from the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel and show you a key prophetic code that was hidden in a prophecy by Hosea, where we are going to see in great depth and detail how knowing when the events that occurred in the historical timeline and biblical time clock that the first four biblical feasts were prophetically symbolic of, concerning when Yeshua died on the cross, his burial and resurrection, is going to open up to us the season of when the last three feasts still to be fulfilled are going to take place, which is Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, which is prophetically symbolic of the rapture, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, which is prophetically symbolic of the Great Tribulation, which ends with Yeshua's second coming at the Battle of Armageddon, where he defeats the false prophet, the Antichrist, and the Antichrist armies gathered to fight against him. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents when Yeshua will set up his throne in Jerusalem, from where he will rule and reign with his bride on earth for a thousand years. In this episode, we have seen a lot of evidence from scripture and credible historical sources outside of the Bible that Yeshua was crucified in the year 30 AD in the Roman Gregorian calendar that the world uses, which is the year 4000 on the biblical calendar. In other words, 4000 years from the time that Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. There is a prophetic code that was hidden in a prophecy by Hosea and Zechariah, which in several episodes to follow, I am then going to back up and add evidence to with more than 42 other scriptures, which all tell us that it will be 2000 years from the time when Yeshua was crucified until when the prophetic meaning of the last three biblical feasts is fulfilled. So if the Messiah died in 30 AD, which clearly appears to be the case based on several witnesses and historical confirmations establishing the matter, then we have an amazing opportunity faced in front of us, where we are now equipped and enabled to simply add 2000 years to 30 AD and arrive at 2030 AD as the season of time of the events surrounding Yeshua's second coming, coming to a conclusion. In other words, the rapture, great tribulation, 
and second coming of the Messiah at the Battle of Armageddon, having a highly likely probability of all being over and having already happened by the season somewhere approximately around the end of 2030 in the Roman Gregorian calendar that the world uses. And if that is accurate and correct, that means that in 2023, we are somewhere in or around the season of the beginning of the final seven years. So with the 70 weeks prophetic timeline in Daniel firmly established, let's move on to see how this foundation of understanding we now have is going to open up much revelation about where we are in world history today and just how close the season of Yeshua's second coming truly is. The final seven years in the 70 weeks prophetic timeline in Daniel, which is called the 70th week, in which all the significant events surrounding Yeshua the Messiah's first coming took place, is also a prophetic foreshadow of what will take place in the final seven years of world history that we are just about to walk into, where this time the false messiah, the Antichrist, is going to arrive on the scene and is going to mimic all that the real messiah, Yeshua, did in that final seven year period where just as the Messiah arrived on the scene, beginning his ministry of doing the work of the kingdom and spreading the gospel of his new covenant, in the same way, when the Antichrist arrives on the scene, he is going to bring his covenant, which is the new world order. And just like what happened at the three and a half year midpoint when Yeshua was on earth, where an abomination of desolation took place when he was crucified on the cross, so at the midpoint of the final seven-year period, the Antichrist will mimic a counterfeit death and resurrection, where scripture describes in Revelations 13 verse 3 and Revelations 13 verses 12 to 14, how he will receive a fatal head wound and then in front of the whole world, with lying signs and wonders, the false prophet will appear to raise him back to life in what will be a counterfeit resurrection. And in order to so closely mirror the real Messiah, the Antichrist may even appear to be killed on Passover, appear to be dead during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and raised on the Feast of First Fruits to deceive the Jewish people and some Christians by appearing to fulfill the scriptures, or it may be during the time of Easter, which is the official occultic celebration of the Antichrist that the majority of Christians have already been pre-programmed into, or both, who knows, time will tell. But this deceptive miracle will convince and deceive the majority of the world that the Antichrist is the real Messiah. And then, just like what happened at the three and a half year midpoint when Yeshua was here, the three and a half year midpoint in the final seven years, the Antichrist will commit the ultimate abomination of desolation. And the abomination of desolation, as well as all the other events that will take place in this profoundly significant final seven year period, is what we are going to look at next in the following episodes, which is episode two and three. I'm very excited because I still have so much more to show you. But before we rush off into all the very interesting things that are about to take place in the final seven years, in the next two episodes, let's just pause for a second and take a moment to appreciate how profound everything that has opened up so far truly is. Because what we are looking at here is groundbreaking solid proof showing the world that Yeshua 
truly is the Messiah. And so for anybody who has questioned or doubted if Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, is truly the Son of God, well, if you sit down and look at this and take the time to truly understand and get it, this should settle all doubts and all arguments and be an absolutely life-changing revelation. There is lots of archaeological and historical evidence, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, among many others, that prove that the Old Testament and the prophecies in it, like in Daniel, Jonah, etc., was written hundreds of years before Yeshua was even born. And yet it foretold the details of his life with pinpoint accuracy, revealing the exact year that Yeshua would come and begin his ministry and the exact year of when he would die for us and all the significant events surrounding that, like the exact year that the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed as a result. And history confirms every detail. And it really did happen exactly as the Bible said. Yeshua fulfilled everything the Old Testament said that he would do. So far, we have seen six key prophetic events fall into place on the timeline with absolute precision. But there are actually 2,500 prophecies in the Bible about the different details of Yeshua's life. And he has already fulfilled 2,000 of them in his first coming precisely. The other 500 prophecies still to be fulfilled are concerning his second coming. But do you know what is the probability of one person fulfilling all 2,000 of those prophecies just by coincidence? A professional mathematician once took the time to calculate the probability that this could happen by random chance, and it is so impossibly small that you can't even put the number on the screen. And so to help us picture it, this mathematician likened it to trying to find a buried golf ball in the whole continent of Africa covered with sand one meter deep. But Yeshua did fulfill all those 2000 prophecies exactly to the T down to the smallest minuscule detail. After seeing this, how can anybody say that Bible prophecy is not real? After seeing and understanding this, I don't see how anybody cannot conclude that this is absolutely profoundly supernatural. It's just too big, too deep, and too impossible to be random. This proves beyond any conceivable doubt that the Word of God is not just an ordinary book written by a couple of random people. It is God-breathed and God-inspired, and it is not a matter of if, it is a matter of fact. This proves without any conceivable doubt that Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, is the Messiah. Yahweh is real. Yeshua is real. The Bible is real and the prophecies in it are real. And we all need to work together to get this vitally important message out to the world because time is very short. Hear the short extract from the testimony of what I can tell you is a genuine true story of a lovely man called Brandon who had a supernatural experience where Abba Father took him to the time of the Great Tribulation after the rapture had taken place, which I will be sharing with you through this video series. But listen to this important part he mentions here. But I, but I see all this going on in heaven. And Jesus looked at me and he said, you need to tell my people I'm coming. Tell my people I'm coming. I said, Lord, we, I, I, I kind of looked and I'm like, wow, like, 
well, we know. But he, he was urgent in his eyes. No, you don't know. Tell my people I'm coming. And folks, this was in 2014. This is in 2014. Now we're in 2021. And I, and I, and I saw things uh, when I was on the earth. Uh, some things that, that he told me I couldn't talk about. Uh, that I, I really would love to share. But I'm in obedience to him. I, I can't. Um, time frames, things like that. And all I can tell you now is that we really are there. We really, 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 really are. And I hope I'm coming across uh, strong about this because Jesus is coming and it's serious now, even more so than what you can comprehend. Um, if you only really, really knew. That's all I can say. If you have loved ones that don't know Jesus Christ and you're scared to tell them uh, about him, you're about to miss your opportunity. And they could spend the rest of their life in hell. You're running out of time. I'm just going to be really real with you. It's coming to a time now that it's over. I hope you are catching a glimpse of how little time we have left to share this with others. And with all these video teachings, including this video, I want to do more than just feast with you on the Word of God and impart revelation to you. I want to equip you to share it with others. And so for anybody who is willing to take it, I am passing on the baton to you to share this vitally important message with as many people as possible. Of course, the easiest way is just to pass on these videos to them and feel free to do that. We would appreciate you helping us by spreading the news about these videos, which are freely available to all on whatever social media platforms you have. But you are also welcome to take the information and share it with others yourself. The prayer of my heart is that people will take this and translate this into different languages so that it can go to every nation on earth. So I'm giving this information to you to freely share. So please note that all the videos in the Book of Revelation series are on our website, www.goldeneagles.africa. And then next to each video, starting with this one, and eventually with all the videos, you will be able to download a Word document or PDF with the word-for-word -word notes of the teachings in each video, as well as the PowerPoint slides that you have looked at throughout this video while I have been speaking, as well as lecture notes in PowerPoint form that makes it very easy for you to share this teaching with others. And so it's there for you to freely use. And on our website is an explanation of how to use these notes together with the slides. And then if you want to, you can adapt it and change it to your own flavor and way of sharing his word with others, but at least it gives you something to start with. But just remember, the gospel is not for sale. This is not something that people can abuse for financial gain. Freely you have received, and in the same way, freely give. So feel free to take this information and use it and share it with others, where you can take any sections of this teaching as appropriate, depending on the time that you have, because obviously it's not possible to share it all at once, and share it in your church or your Bible study or with people that you meet with in everyday life. 
And all you really need is just to use this one slide summarizing the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy and Jonah prophecy and the four significant events that took place in the temple between 30 AD and 70 AD. And that in itself is solid, undeniable proof that you now have to show the world that Yeshua is the son of the living God. And so for people who are sitting on the fence about Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, this can really open their eyes to show them that he is who he says he is. So please take note of this because it's a very valuable tool and weapon that you can keep in your arsenal for the days ahead when many people start to question who is the real Messiah especially when the false messiah, the Antichrist, steps onto the world stage very soon. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no more time left for procrastination. Right now, we need to rise up as an army in the body of Christ and take hands and more than ever before, start sharing the gospel of salvation and the prophetic warnings in scripture of the signs of the times we are in and the urgency to wash our wedding garments through a lifestyle of repentance and sanctification so that we can be ready and prepared as his bride for the rapture and marriage supper of the Lamb. Because time is very, very short now. His coming is very near. His coming is right at the door. Daniel 12 verses 3 to 4 speaks of the end times when Abba Father will open up the understanding of the prophecies of his word to his people. Those who are spiritually wise will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the scroll until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and search anxiously through the scroll and knowledge of the purpose of God as revealed by his prophets will greatly increase. We are so extremely blessed to be gaining revelation and understanding of the meaning and deep treasures of God's word that the prophets of old longed to have, including Daniel himself, as mentioned in Daniel 12 verses 8 to 9. As for me, I heard, but I did not understand. So I said, Adonai, what will be the outcome of all of these things? And the angel said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are concealed and sealed up until the time of the end. God placed a veil over the prophecies of the end times in Scripture so that their meaning could not be understood until the end times. And in fact, the meaning of the name of the book of Revelation means removing the veil so that we can clearly see and understand the great and wonderful mysteries of these prophecies. And Yahweh is bringing revelation like this to the forefront in these days, because as I spoke about earlier, there is a false Messiah that is just about to step onto the world stage. These are already days of great deception. And in the times ahead, the deceptions will increase at a rapidly accelerating rate. But the greatest deception of all will be the Antichrist presenting himself to the world as the Messiah. And one cannot overemphasize how clever and cunning this deception is going to be. We are talking about deception to the nth degree here where the Bible warns that even God's very elect will be deceived if possible. And as I said earlier, 
You don't deceive people with a blatant lie. He's going to come looking so close to the real thing in so many ways. The ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. He's going to be good looking, charismatic, well spoken, and have a magnetic energy about him that is going to make the world flock to him and adore him. And initially, they will not be aware of the dangerous, deceptive serpent within him. They will just be captivated by his good looking outer appearance and all the lying signs and wonders and counterfeit miracles that follow him. And so the reason Abba Father is allowing us to clearly see and understand all these prophecies now is because he wants us to have an absolute unshakable confidence in who he is and in who Yeshua is so that we can be equipped and ready for the hard times ahead where the faith of people is going to be severely tested. And Yahweh wants for the faith of his children to be rock solid and nothing builds faith like a solid grounding in his word. Because as Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. This is where we can sink our roots deep so that we can stand strong in the storms ahead. In these days, Abba Father has been revealing things that have been hidden in scripture since the beginning. And the reason why is because before Yeshua returns and before the Antichrist that is coming steps up to take his place on the world stage, humanity must have no excuse. So as the prophet Daniel foretold, knowledge of the purpose of God as revealed by his prophets shall be increased in the end times. And that time, ladies and gentlemen, is now. I turn and face the cross. I see my sin grieving your heart. I turn and face the cross. I know it's judgment I deserve. I turn and face the cross. I turn and face the cross I know my soul is parched and dry I turn and face the cross I'm a sinner dead inside I turn and face the cross I turn and face the cross you accept me as your child I turn and face the cross I cry Father forgive me forgive me
Father, you love the world so much that you gave your only Son to die for our sins, so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I am a sinner. With heartfelt conviction, I repent for my sins and I ask you to forgive me. Your word says that I'm saved by grace through faith as a gift from you. There is nothing I can do to end salvation and I humbly acknowledge my need for a savior. I believe and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross for me and bore all my sins, paying the price for them. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead and that he is alive today. By faith, I receive Jesus Christ now as my Lord and Savior. I believe that I am saved and I will spend eternity with you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me and restoring me into a right relationship with the Father. From now on, I will trust in you and live to love you.